sir is looking very serious today kya hua lalit sir mute you are muted after yesterday's uh, this thing but day before yesterday you were not there 8:30 it went on till 11:30 going to go on sir you are muted you are muted yourself those sessions are for uh, dr chitra and uh, and uh, santosh on our uh, yeah live please okay a uh, very good evening to one and all of you for this arc pg update we- uh, webinar on retina today we are lucky to have the choicest of expert panel and a very capable set of speakers and some very relevant topics which have been beautifully laid out to keep us all bound to our seats we have on our panel dr ns murlidhar who would be joining any time now who is the president of the retina institute of karnataka a leader amongst leaders in retina the senior most retina specialist in karnataka to be reckoned with and has his array of awards and recognitions we have with us dr dinesh salwar senior consultant ophthalmologist and senior specialist with your retina and uveal disorders from cfs delhi who has held many honorary posts with great recognitions and tributes we have with us dr lalit verma who has held the most highly coveted posts which aos could ever have has left an undelible mark as a chairman scientific committee for his 6 year term has brought in many initiatives that has bound the entire aos together has 172 publications innumerable awards and orations to his credit dr guru prasad our esteemed expert speak panel is the director of clinical services and head of vitual retina services of mm joshi i hospitals with a great presence is north karnataka a path breaker in the number of surgeries performed and of course ever increasing numbers we have with us dr jatinder singh senior consultant with your retina and uvia services at the coimbatore branch of the i foundation group of hospitals a surgeon par excellence in dealing with the most complex surgeries astute knowledgeable and has trained post graduates and retina fellows over 15 years evolving the curriculum with major contributions in publications and more i have none other than dr srinivas dosh joshi moderating with me with his fiery energy to get the best out of this webinar and let's watch on besides being an amazingly skilled surgeon with very impressive academic career his area of interest has been artificial retina one of the first indians to be trained in this complex field with some of the most impressive awards i'm not listing them received at a very young age which reflects his brilliance he is also the member arc south with a brilliant future ahead so we shall now go on to our great speakers the first one is the section on how to read and our first speaker is dr neha goel who would elaborate on how to read the oct so the post graduates and other ophthalmologists watch on she is currently a senior consultant with your retina surgeon at max multi specialty hospital new delhi and has a keen interest in academics with over 90 pubmed index publications in the field of vitreo retina on to you dr neha thank you dr chitra and i thank aoa especially dr shrinivas for giving me this opportunity so i'm going to talk for the next 8 minutes about how to read an oct an oct which is the most commonly performed investigation not just in retina medical retina but pan ophthalmology as we know it's a non invasive non contact method of examination of the retinal layers and we've been uh, witness to these generations of oct which started with time domain and are now up to swept source with basic changes in the resolution so this is how the image has changed over the last two decades as we've been seeing time domain spectral domain ultra high resolution and now the swept source and what is it that actually makes these generations different uh, the swept source differs in wavelength which is longer 1050 and uh, the spectral domain and time domain uh, differ in the detector as in the spectrometer now this translates into greater number of a scans per second a longer scan length and then consequently the better resolution so the interpretation of an oct image basically talks about the reflectivity which is the proportion of light which is back scat back scattered by a tissue in addition to being absorbed or transmitted we have structures which are hyper reflective and those which are hypo reflective and this is what we talk about when we read a report 
These are the normal retinal layers, which you would see in a spectralis OCT, and the nomenclature has been given by the International Society. So when we read a report, we usually talk about the vitroretinal interface, the retinal architecture, and then the RP choriocapillaris complex. And with enhanced resolution, we also talk about the vitreous as well as the choroid and even the choroid scleral junction. Let's look at the normal first. This is a normal swept source OCT image. Here you see a slight bulge beneath the fovea, which is supposed to be the elongated tips of the photoreceptors, outer tips, which is normal, a blood vessel leading to shadowing, and always remember to check what is the direction and the length of the scan. Now, starting with the vitreous, this is the normal vitreous where you have the precortical vitreous pocket, the Clopet's canal, and a one-way valve, which is now beautifully demonstrated by your swept source OCT. Let's read these two OCTs. Both of them show hyperreflectivity in the vitreous. What is it? You have to look clinically. One is vitreous cells, while the other is a vitreous bleed. What about this one? The hyperreflectivity seems to be on both sides of the macula. So this is a classic picture of asteroid hylosis where you get a mirror artifact. Next, we go to the VR interface, where again, the stages of PVD can be beautifully demonstrated by the OCT. We must be able to recognize a vitromacular adhesion where the foveal contour is normal and a vitromacular traction where the foveal contour gets obliterated. Now, full thickness macular holes, OCT is, of course, indispensable for the diagnosis, and you can stage it as per the gas classification with regards to the size and the absence or presence of uh, PVT. When you read a OCT in a macular hole case, be sure to mention these indices, the macular hole index and the hole form factor, both of which have a bearing on the visual prognostication post-surgery. Hole closure can be seen in different uh, in different ways, the top two are the ones we usually see, whereas the lower two should also not be mistaken for non-closure. Now, question time. I know we are short of time, but what does this look to you like? And you might very well get it an, in an exam. So here you see there is a discontinuity in the neurosensory retina. So is it just a macular hole? No. If you look carefully, you can't see the RP choriocapillaris complex here. And the reason is that because the retina is detached, and this is actually a case of high myopia. So my tip here would be that whenever you get an OCT to read, please first mention the findings and don't jump straight to the diagnosis that this is a macular hole. When you read out the findings, you'll be able to reach the better diagnosis yourself. Epiretinal membranes are hyperreflective lines seen at the vitroretinal interface, which can be attached focally or globally. Let's look at some other holes now, a pseudo hole where you have a steep configuration of the walls and a lamellar hole where you have an inverted mushroom shape. This should be differentiated from the lamellar hole associated epiretinal proliferation, as you can see from the arrows, and also from an outer lamellar hole, which you basically just get in two conditions, a solar retinopathy or a dyspic maculopathy. Now, when you mention about the interface, also do talk about the foveal contour, which can be obliterated basically because it's hyperplastic, it's being pulled, pushed, or a combined mechanism. Third, we come to the retinal architecture, which we commonly see as fluid, which may be intraretinal or subretinal, may be accompanied by hard exudates. Diabetic macular edema, you are very likely to get an OCT of this. And when you read this, do look at the central foveal thickness to determine whether it is center involving or non-center involving. Now, most of the cutoff is around 300 microns. OCT in DME also interestingly tells us a lot about the biomarkers, where we look at these four layers. And these are said to corroborate with the visual acuity, not just in DME, but a host of other macular disorders. Drill is another feature which you can mention, the disorganization of the retinal inner layers, which is again a biomarker. But please remember that these do not work if the edema is too much. Now look at these two scans. Yes, it's edema, but what else? The one on your left shows inner retinal hyperreflectivity, which is indicative of ischemia, even when you read the OCT. And the other one shows a predominantly one-sided edema, which again will point to a retinal vascular occlusion. Another question, what investigation will you order when you see this OCT? Now, you'll be very tempted to say FFA, but look carefully. This is not edema. This is kysis, which you can see in X-linked retinoschisis or even in dyspic maculopathy. Now, how do you differentiate? You see these typical pillars at the level of the inner nuclear layer, uh, which give it a ladder appearance. And of course, the fundus examination clinches the diagnosis. Another condition where you get skysis is the high myopic tractional maculopathy, where it may or may not be accompanied by a subfoveal detachment. This will again be apparent on clinical examination. Let's look at this and read this OCT. What do you see? The EZ is only present subfovily, it's absent elsewhere. What would your guess be? 
This is the AF, another hinge, the Robson holder ring. So this is a typical case of RP where you see only the end photoreceptors are left in the subcovial region. Another dystrophy with the OCT, here you see the defect in the photoreceptor, which also points towards the diagnosis of cone dystrophy when you read this OCT. Now, this is the last part of the retinal architecture, MACTEL or macular telangiectasia, an important disorder to recognize where you see mismatch between the angiographic leakage and the thickness on the OCT. And you might very well get this OCT to read where you have to say you see either the inner or outer hyporeflective cavities, sometimes accompanied by this typical ILM drape, a collapse of the outer retina in the later stages with foveal thinning and the pigment. Now, fourth, we come to the RP choriocapillaris complex. The commonest disorder we see here are drusen, which may be hard, soft, One minute left. or the subretinal drusenoid deposits called the pseudodrusen. Geographic atrophy, again, a striking feature. And the PDs, this again, you can get to read. So how do you differentiate them? In serous, you have an optically clear space, which becomes ecogenic in fibrovascular. You see a distinct band of the choroid in serous, which is again absent due to the shadowing effect in hemorrhagic. And... You must remember that while the top two are non-neovascular, the bottom three are the ones you see in neovascular AMD. Type 1 CNVM, which is sub-RP, type 2, which is sub-retinal and has a better prognosis. And let's look at this, another question. Is this a CNVM? No. If you look carefully, the line of the RP choriocapillaris is intact and there is hyper-AF suggesting to a vitelliform lesion. Type 3 will show you a serious PD with CME and PCV, now more and more we are going towards the OCT diagnosis as well. When you read this OCT, you see there's a discontinuity in the RP pointing towards the RPE zip. The last part is OCT in CSC, where we, we can easily recognize the PD and the NSD for diagnosis and monitoring. What additional you can read in this OCT is the posterior surface. The more granulated it is, the more duration and the poorer prognosis it points towards. Another pointer in the OCT is the site of the leak. Sometimes you can get this PD with the sagging or dipping of the neurosensory retina and this vacuole sign, which suggests that it might even be steroid induced. Um, what is this? It looks very much like a CSC, but again, always corroborate clinically. This is actually a pseudohypopion in best disease. And this is an important thing I'd like to end with. What will you do next when you see this OCT picture? And I actually got this in my PG exam about 15 years back. I said FFA and Dr. S. P. Garg looked at me very sternly and said, please look again. So the key here is that you cannot see the extent of the neurosensory detachment. So what you should do next is a distant direct ophthalmoscopy, because what you might be looking at is an RD and not a CSC. Similarly, another case where you see these outer retinal folds, again, typical of a RD and not a central serous choreoretinopathy. The last part about the choroid, I'll just mention that it's important to look for because you can uh, pick up pachychoroid diseases, VKH, and of course, choroidal neoplasms. And choroidal thickness must always be correlated with age. As we know, it grows thinner with age. And in PCV, it will be thinner as compared to a patient with RAP or pseudodrusin. So this is basically a word about the pachychoroid diseases where you see dilatation of the larger choroidal vessels and loss of the small and medium vessels. And these Packy vessels can also be seen. If you compare with normal, it's very obvious. Compare this with the choroiditis or VKH, where there is diffuse thickening of all the layers, maybe accompanied by a wavy choroid or an elevation. Now, the last slide about the clinical pearls, wh whether to do radial or uh, raster. So the consensus is that in all diseases except neovascular AMD, radial is comparable to raster and has the advantage of being faster. Look at this OCT. If you get this in the exam, what are you going to say? Just like an FFA, you should ask for more films because sometimes what looks like an edema might actually be a macular hole. So if you look at the consecutive films, you'll see this is actually a defect in the neurosensory retina. So to conclude, OCT is indispensable for the diagnosis, monitoring, and prognosis of virtually all retinal disorders. It gives us quantitative measurements. And in accordance with NFAS and OCT Anjo, it provides us a wealth of information. But the eyes only see what the mind knows, so a good knowledge of the subject is irreplaceable. Thank you. Wonderful talk, uh, Neha. Just absolutely wonderful. So I'll ask one very simple PG question, and Srinivas will attack you more. So. <laughs> How would you differentiate uh, for the PGs? How would you differentiate a post op CME from a diabetic macular edema on OCT? 
So very good and very relevant question. So like I had shown, sometimes in diabetic macular edema, you can have associated heart exudates, which you will not get in the pseudophagic CME. Also, the pseudophagic CME is usually more evenly distributed around the fovea as compared to a diabetic, which may sometimes be focal. But then finally, I would say that FFA would help you because you would get a uh, staining at the optic nerve head also in the pseudophagic CME because of breakdown of the blood vitreous barrier, which you will not get in a diabetic unless there is NVD, which is again clear evidently. Anything more to add? Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Neha. I think you have covered most of the topics in just eight to nine minutes. I think it's really awesome presentation. Thank you. And very good pictures you have used and with the case pulls also in this short time. Thank you very much. I had one question. See, most of our postgraduates or the younger ophthalmologists, vitreoretinal surgeon, they ask, there are so many in the macular hole, you have macular hole index, you have whole form fracture, you have tractional hole index, you have macular hole volume, you have diametric hole index. So what are the, these important things they need to know or they need to know everything from the exam point of view? Even when you showed the ERM pictures, do they need to know about the staging of ERM as well uh, for passing the DNB or the MS exams? So starting with macular hole, I showed the two which we commonly use clinically and, uh, you know, which uh, should be known. It is desirable, though it is not absolutely necessary, the macular hole index and the hole form factor. So these two, I think if you know these and you are able to say this, this should be enough uh, to pass very comfortably. Of course, for your interest, all the ones you mentioned can be looked at. Similarly, for epiretinal membrane, yes, I did not show that classification because of, uh, you know, want of time. But uh, it actually involves the ectopic inner foveal layers also, which is a relatively new concept even for VR specialists. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, penalize a PG for not knowing that. So it's more important that they recognize it clinically and, you know, they understand the, the, the pathophysiology and all of that. So staging, yes, again, desirable. But these, are, I would not say that these are must know uh, for the exam. Nice, nice, nice answer. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask our moderator, Jatinder, sir. Can you just unmute yourself? Yeah, no, just uh, uh, one point uh, to answer Dr. Chitra's question. Uh, to differentiate uh, edema, uh, CME in a diabetic patient who has some macronisms but no deposits uh, at macula, uh, compared to a patient who is having a pseudophagic CME, uh, you can do a peripapillary nerve fiber layer thickness. And this is uh, what I've been using uh, to differentiate the two. And I, I think uh, it's pretty accurate. If the RNFL is thickened, it indicates more of an inflammatory etiology that is post-op CME uh, versus a, a DME case where the RNFL thickness is more or less comparable to the fellow eye. But this also helps to guide and target your uh, therapy accordingly because uh, for a pseudopic CME, you can just treat with peribulbar steroids. Whereas for a center involving DME in the form of cystoid edema, you still have to go with anti yeah. Yes, uh, quick points from Lalit, sir, and then we can move on to the next talk. Wonderful presentation. It's an injustice that you have asked her to present in eight minutes a full book of OCT. <laughs> that was the first comment. The second uh, very good point Neha made was none of the interpreters should jump on one frame. She emphasized very nicely. And second is go layer by layer in interpretation. Never jump to diagnosis on OCT frame unless it is very obvious. Go layer by layer, whether RP is intact or not, what is happening to inner retina, what is happening to outer retina. So classify interface, outer retina, inner retina. And then I think diagnosis will become simpler. Probably that way, uh, pseudophagic uh, CME would also affect the inner uh, our inner nuclear layer first then a dme and outer that would also be yeah. that is the reason because from from ilm till erm it is inner retina from erm to rp it is outer retina so that is the and interface is where vitreous meets the ilm so all the pg should classify their inner retinal disease outer retinal outer retinal would typically mean armd pcvs and other things in a retina, all the inflammatory pathologies, RVOs and DMEs and other things. And Jati made a very relevant point that you see RNFL measurement. We primarily go with inflammatory pathologies. Thank you. So one more thing I think uh, uh, I would like to add is uh, the PGs should refrain from offering a diagnosis or exact etiological diagnosis, uh, but just by seeing any imaging, not just OCT, but any even FFA ultrasound. They should just highlight the features like hyperreflectivity, hyperreflectivity, the configuration, the location of the lesion, 
rather than just saying that it is detachment or CSR or, or any other uh, point diagnosis. Absolutely. Very, very good point, sir. Uh, yeah, true. And uh, we welcome Dr. N.S. Murlidhar, sir, also to this uh, uh, thing. And yes, I think the next only. speaker, he can uh, just answer people. We shall yes. then go on to our next speaker, Khan, who is going to be elaborating on reading the FFA. He's a prolific pituitary surgeon from Sachitana Eyes Clinic. I don't know I'm pronouncing it right. And with an expertise in diabetic retinopathy and retinal detachment. On to you, Dr. Shrikan. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Yes. Hope the screen is visible. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the, this is a, a, a short talk on interpretation of a fluorescent angiogram. And as you see, when you see a color fundus photograph, uh, you might see a lot of uh, uh, red and uh, uh, red and orange and yellow, but a uh, lot of details that we could miss. And the sepia tones sometimes reveal a lot of information which we would have otherwise missed, like uh, neovascularization and a uh, lot of uh, microaneurysms in the uh, perimacular uh, area. And decoding the sepia tones is what we are going to learn today. So the main difference between looking at a fundus photograph and doing a fluorescent angiogram is the FFA is a time bound test. So our photography skills and capturing of the images and timing is very absolutely crucial. And the, on the right side, you can see a live FFA video that we have taken at uh, on an HRA and this is how fast the angiogram FFA progresses from early at the choroidal phase to a navy phase and recirculation phase within a matter of 40 seconds. So uh, capturing the images, concentrating on getting good quality photographs as a postgraduate is more important than trying to make a diagnosis while you are capturing the images from a PG point of view. Some trivia, this was discovered in 1959 by Novotny and Alvis and they tested first on rabbits that uh, there is an emission spectrum and an absorption spectrum, which is 480 and 520 nanometers. And finally, one of the scientists was the first human uh, 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 guinea pig to undergo the fluorescent angiogram, and they tested it on themselves. That's how confident they were about their test. So there is a blue excitation and a green barrier filter, which uh, blocks the abnormal fluorescence and allows only the fluorescence from the structures to pass through and fall on the camera sensor. The phases of the fluorescent angiogram, there is an early choroidal phase, which is uh, within the first 10 seconds. And this is a diffuse background choroidal flush where the choroid, entire choroid blows up. And you can see some areas of choroidal infarct as a dark patch. And the arterial phase lasts for a very short three seconds. And uh, the arteries fill up uh, with the background of the choroidal flush. And then there is an AV phase, which is further broken down into a early AV and a late AV phase. This is the phase where we are going to look at the foveal avascular zone and the integrity of that. And within the first 40 seconds, we are the dye has already left the retinal circulation and reached the kidneys and is back into the retina in the recirculation phase. Abnormal fluorescence is further divided into either a hypofluorescence or a hyperfluorescence. Hypo is, as the name suggests, where the fluorescence from the either the retinal vasculature or the choroidal uh, background flush is blocked either due to a presence of blood clots or pigments or any other lesion that is not allowing us to view the choroidal fluorescence or the uh, overlying uh, clot that is blocking the normal choroidal fluorescence or hyperfluorescence where there is increased visibility of the choroidal fluorescence or there is abnormal leakage from an abnormal structure. This is the basic principle. This could be either due, hyper can be due to leak or transmitted fluorescence or pooling or staining and hypo can be either blocked or a filling defect. So let's go to the uh, hyperfluorescence types. The, here, this is a one uh, very classic example of a classic versus an occult CNVM. In a classic CNBM, you can see that there is a filling of the uh, lesion in the very early phase, what we call classically described as a lacy pattern of dye filling. The entire lesion fills up during the early arterial phase itself, and the lesion borders are very indistinct and feathery, and they start to be, uh, increase in size. And by the end of the uh, fluorescent angiogram, the lesion, entire lesion lights up, and you can see the entire size of the lesion. 
In a knuckled CNVM, uh, the filling is very patchy because the, the distribution of the lesion is at a different plane and uh, you don't see the entire extent of the lesion uh, as typically that you would see in a classic CNVM. So this is the main striking difference that you would see in a classic versus an occult CNVM. Other type of hyperphoresis that you would see typically in a diabetic is due to microaneurysms. This is something that we need to see. Any lesion that we are going to treat within the macula, I would always recommend a fluorescein angiogram to map out the area that we are going to treat with laser. For example, this is a large area of hard exudates, but on fluorescein angiogram, we can see that the, the cluster of microaneurysms and the maximum amount of leakage does not really correspond to the maximum area of hard exudates. So the leakage is somewhere else, but the extent of hard exudates is somewhere else. So probably this would guide us to doing our laser very well. So you can see these light up as uh, small uh, stars in the sky in the early phase and they the, slowly begin to leak and become clumps over the mid and the late phases. That is how a microaneurysm would look. The other typical example of a, a hyperfluorescence is ink blot hyperfluorescence that we see in a CSR. That appears as a small dot of hyperfluorescence in the early phase and goes on increasing as the dye accumulates in the subretinal space and uh, the lesion becomes larger and larger as described like an ink blot. And by the end of the uh, late phase, you can see a large blot. So this is a typical ink blot CSR. Here, the site of leak is the defect in the RPE where the choroidal and the retinal uh, uh, the circulation dye is leaking through the gaps in the RPE and accumulating in the subretinal space. So this is another example where both hyper and hypofluorescence we can see in a diabetic retinopathy where there is a large front of neovascularization that would uh, start leaking because this is an abnormal blood vessel and the vessels are leaky that would start leaking the dye right from the early phase of the angiogram and the leak only goes on increasing to become larger and brighter through the mid and late phases. And you can see that the leak is more visible in the other areas of the neovascularization also. And you can also see an area of blocked fluorescence where the normal choroidal fluorescence is blocked by this presence of a preretinal hemorrhage. And this extent of blockage, which is blocking even the normal retinal vasculature, shows us that it is a preretinal hemorrhage. And this is another example where there is a diffuse leakage from a capillary blood uh, where you cannot really distinguish any microaneurysms because the entire capillary blood, bed is leaking. This could be in a diabetic or also, also in a uh, pseudophagic CME where you see uh, a diffuse leakage which is uh, showing a cystoid macular edema or a flower petaloid, a petaloid appearance of the leakage by the late phase of the angiogram. And the third type of hyperfluorescence that we see is a transmitted hyperfluorescence where the choroidal hyperfluorescence becomes more visible because the overlying RPE is absent or damaged and that allows more of the choroidal fluorescence to be seen better. So this is one example in a sick RPE due to chronic CSR, you can see more visibility of the choroidal hyperfluorescence, which is an RPE track in a CSR. And also you can see active ink blots leaks, which are active leaks from a uh, CSR defect. The third type is transmitted fluorescence in a geographic atrophy. The main difference in the geographic atrophy uh, and other types of hyperfluorescence is the size and the dimension of the lesion of, or the patch of hyperfluorescence doesn't increase over time. It remains the same and it may fade away by the end of the late phase. So that is the main Thank difference you. that we need to keep in mind. So, Hypofluorescence can either be blockage of the fluorescence due to blood, either could be preretinal or intraretinal. When the blood is preretinal, it blocks all the structures underneath it, blood vessels, chor choroidal fluorescence, everything. If it's intraretinal, the blood vessels may be visible. Filling defect where the dye doesn't fill that area at all. So you can see that as a black patch. These are the avascular zones, and this is very necessary to plan out your laser treatment. And this is one example. How do we read a fluorescein angiogram as a postgraduate? Which eye you need to mention first? Which quadrant of the angiogram are we seeing? We need to say, and what phase of the angiogram are we looking at? And what is the kind of abnormal fluorescence? Whether it is a hypo or a hyperfluorescence, we need to mention. And how does it change over time? Does it increase in size, intensity, and 
over time and does it fade away by the end of the late phase and what is the likely cause of abnormal fluorescence we may commit to a diagnosis but it is not an absolute must so that's it thank you thank you very much dr shrikant that was also again uh, extremely thank good you. so back to one question by from me so what are the clear indications for doing ffa in a diabetic retinopathy uh see uh in, in a diabetic retinopathy, now that we are uh, migrating more towards OCT-based treatment, especially for macular edema, and uh, more, which are based, uh, basing more of our uh, diagnosis for a PDR uh, based on fundus photos and clinical examination, there are such in situations, I, I still do a, a baseline fluorescein angiogram in a patient where I can't really correlate the extent of vision loss and the extent of macular changes. Uh, in, in cases where the edema is very minimal, but the gross vision loss, and I suspect a macular ischemia. Or in a, in a patient where the retina looks absolutely fine, but I can't really explain the loss of vision. Could be a featureless retina. And those are the two cases where I still uh, depend on a fluorescein angiogram as a baseline investigation to map out the extent of ischemia and also the areas of leak. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srikant. Uh, the quick uh, thing, uh, what Srikant said, very nice presentation. I just want to add, uh, before I ask uh, Murli Dar, sir, to uh, please uh, give, give you comments on this uh, topic. So whenever a question is asked on this, he has very nicely explained. The interpretation of an FFA is very important. We have seen, we just conducted the postgraduate education program just two weeks back in Hubli. And I could see most of the postgraduates entering it as, sir, it's a case of CSCR. So it's a case of ink blot pattern. So what I would rather suggest is, first ask for the clinical findings, if they give it. If no, if they give you a single frame, at least first identify whether it's a red-free, pseudofluorescence or autofluorescence, and then go in for which eye it is, whether it's a right eye or the left eye. And then you can go in for any arm retinal delay time. And then I have made a small mnemonic as SAM. Sequential, anatomical, and morphological. Sequential in the sense, face by face. I've seen many of them directly jumping into saying, sir, this is the case of DME. Which phase it is. If they give you this, phase-wise, it's always better to uh, identify phase-wise. If you get a single picture, which phase it is. Anatomical is whether it's a choroidal, subretinal, preretinal, and M stands for morphological. Then you can comment whether it's on hyper-FAF or hyperfluorescent. Yes, Murli Dar, sir, your comments and thoughts on this, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, Srinivas. Uh, good presentation by Shrikan. Uh, see, when uh, postgraduate, if in the exam, if you are given a fluorescein angiogram, as you rightly said, it how do you interpret it? It depends on whether you are given a single frame. Sometimes you have a large print of a single frame. In that situation, what you need to do is you have to identify the eye, whether it's right eye or left eye, whether to identify what phase of angiogram this is. And then go on to describe whatever abnormality you say. You can say, I see an area of hypofluorescence, which is irregular, you know, near the disc or near the macula, whatever anatomical description you want to give, you need to give. And the end, as you rightly said, you can give a diagnosis or you can say with this information, I can't arrive at a diagnosis with this single frame. If you are given a series of prints of, you know, both eyes, then you can describe uh, this is a fluorescein angiogram described in the sequential event. The right eye in the early AV phase shows this. In the AV phase, it shows this. In the late phase, it shows this. And similarly, in the left eye, uh, in the early phase, arterial phase, it shows this abnormality. In the arteriovenous phase, it shows this abnormality. And then in the late phase, it shows this abnormality. And that's why I think it's a leakage and not a, uh, you know, a, a window defect or, you know, transmitted fluorescent. Like that, you can offer your explanation. So basically, you need to look at the exam and describe how you interpret it so that the examiner knows that, okay, this fellow knows how to read an angiogram. That's all he needs to know. Exactly. I think it's better to, for yourself only, put it in the beginning that the minimum requirement for completing this um, short scene angiography would be a color photograph and two phases, one early and one late phase of the angiogram. Yes. If you're giving me only one and you don't want to give me the other, then I can only say hyper or hypo. I can't even say whether this is transmitted or increasing. So I can only comment on the fluorescein angiographic 
picture. I cannot comment on uh, the on what comes as a functional change in terms of leak, in terms of um, window defect. One picture you can never comment on, and you should not also. So, I mean, this is very important because that can be a trap for you also otherwise. Very, very valid point. Very valid. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chitra, madam, we can move on to the next talk, please. Our next speaker is Dr. Natasha Radhakrishnan, who's going to detail us on B-scan and its relevance. She's a clinical additional professor, Department of Vitrio Retina Surgery from Amrita Hospitals. And let's hear what she says. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, AIOS ARC, for this opportunity. So today we are going to see how to read an ultrasound B scan. You know that B scan is an important adjuvant for our clinical assessment of various ocular and orbital diseases. When do we do a B scan? We do it usually when retinal examination is not possible, either due to edema or uh, corneal opacities, high fema, a lot of conditions, uh, dense cataract where you cannot see the retina. You can also do it sometimes in visible conditions, like for tumors of the eye, ciliary body detachments to distinguish between RRD and exudative RD and a lot of other conditions. Now you need to know a little bit about the physics. So before you interpret it, that is the high frequency sound waves are transmitted from a probe into the eye. The sound waves strike the structures and that is reflected back into the probe, converted into an electrical signal. And this is reconstructed as an image on a monitor, which can be used to make a dynamic evaluation of the eye. In ophthalmic ultrasound, we use high frequency short wavelength ultrasound that gives you higher resolution of the minute ocular and orbital structure as compared to the low frequency of an abdominal ultrasound. The B-scan probe frequency is around 10 megahertz, while we have an advanced B-scan now about 20 to 25 megahertz that will penetrate only 5 to 10 millimeters. Now, what is the image that we see? It is, the, it is called an echo. It is the sound that is reflected from the interface between two media when sound travels from one media to another of different density. And the greater the density difference, the higher the reflectivity. In a B scan, the oscillating sound beam uh, is passing through the eye and imaging a slice of tissue. So the echoes of which are represented as a multitude of dots that come together to form an image. And the stronger the echo, the brighter the dot. Another word that you should know is gain. When gain is high, weaker signals are displayed. And when gain is low, the weaker signals will disappear. So high gain is equal to low resolution. So you will see uh, weaker signals also. Now, uh, this is the probe that is used. And it has a marker, which will denote the position of that. And it is uh, the marker, the area that is marked will be seen at the top part of the, um, angio, uh, of the echogram. Now, there are three probe positions you should know before you interpret it, transverse, longitudinal, and axial. This is the position of the transverse scan, where it will be parallel to the limbus with the pointer either towards the superior area or towards the nasal side. And the longitudinal stand where, uh, scan, where it is perpendicular to the limbus, and it is kept the, with the um, probe marker towards the center of the cornea. It gives you the anteroposterior extent of the lesion. And you should also know about the longitudinal macular scan in which you direct the patient's gaze temporarily, place the probe on the nasal sclera with the marker oriented towards the limbus. This is a horizontal scan of the macula, and it will be seen like this. That is the probe position on top, and in the bottom is your macula scan, where the optic nerve comes in the bottom half of the scan, and the macula will be just above. Now, in a description of a lesion, you need to know the location in relation to easily demonstrable landmarks. You should tell about the extent, anteroposterior and lateral, the dimensions in case of tumors and other solid lesions, shape and configuration, whether it is point-like, membrane-like, or mass-like, internal reflectivity and surface reflectivity of the particular lesion, the structure, whether it is solid or cystic, and a degree of sound attenuation, if any. You should also include mobility, whether it in, uh, in which includes the movement of a live intravitreal uh, organ or after movement such as that is seen with the PVD. Now we will look at how uh, each one can be interpreted in detail. The artifacts that also should be recognized, reverberation artifacts occur when there is a highly reflective surface, which are often seen, especially if the amount of gel that you're using is not enough. You can also get ring down or comet tail artifacts with air bubbles or metal inside the eye. 
Now, how to read? So there are three types of echoes, dot-like echoes, membranous echoes, and tumors. The dot-like echoes, common thing that we see is asteroid hyalosis. You can see bright point echoes inside the vitreous that is uh, with a lucid area between the echoes and the posterior uh, part of the eye. And that is the uh, asteroid hyalosis with 100% reflectivity from the echoes. Now, the A scan vector at the bottom of the uh, B scan will give you an idea about the uh, reflectivity of the um, structures in comparison with the retina and sclera, which gives you the highest 100% reflectivity. So every time you should have the A scan vector also underneath, which will give you an idea about how reflective is that structure. Now, vitreous hemorrhage, fresh vitreous hemorrhage has very low reflective or echolucent, and they may need higher gain for detection. However, organized vitreous hemorrhage will give you membranes of varying reflectivity, and they are usually more denser inferiorly. So this you can see there as compared to an asteroid hyalosis, the vitreous echoes are very low reflective, and you can see some of them are membranous in the lower half of the scans, where you can see that there are membranous echoes because of long-standing vitreous hemorrhage. In endophthalmitis, you're having inflammation in the vitreous cavity. You can get dot-like low reflective echoes or you can get cobweb-like echoes. And sometimes thick, high reflective membrane-like echoes may be seen. And associated features may be a choroidal detachment, retinochoroidal thickening will be marked, and sometimes figural thickening and orbital inflammation if it has gone in for panophthalmitis. This is a uh, endophthalmitis B scan. You can see the thick membranous echoes inside, as well as the retinochoroidal thickening and the black arrow points to some fluid outside the sclera as well. Membrane-like echoes are the next things that you should look for. So you can get membranous echoes in posterior vitreous detachment, retinal detachment, choroidal detachment. Now, how do we differentiate these? Posterior vitreous detachment is seen as a freely mobile membranous echo, and high after movements will be seen. After movements means after the eye has stopped moving, the membrane will still be moving. That is after movements. High after movements, low reflectivity. So here you can see the PVD. You can see the corresponding A scan is extremely low reflectivity and you will see after movements also. In regmatogenous retinal detachment, it will be a thin continuous membrane which is attached to the optic nerve. It will show a 100% reflectivity. And moderate after movements if it is a fresh RRD and no after movements if there is PVR or it is a long-standing RD. Here you can see it is much thicker than the PVD. You can see there is attachment to the optic nerve. And if you see the A-scan vector, which is shown by that white uh, arrow down, you can see that it is having a 100% spike of a retinal detachment. Traction retinal detachment seen as concave membranes with varying extent of vitreous and retinal adhesion with minimal to no after movements will be seen. Exudative detachment, presence of a smooth bullet and shifting fluid. Sometimes you will get echoes inside because of the subretinal fluid being exudates, and you will oh, also be sense. able to demonstrate the changed head position. Choroidal detachment, dome-shaped elevation with a smooth surface with no after movements at all. The serous will be clear inside, and you can get kissing choroidals, and hemorrhagic will have echoes inside. Intraocular foreign body is another important uh, thing that we use the ultrasound B scan for. It gives even better resolution than the CT, and it will be seen as echo dense signal with shadowing persistence of signal. Posterior T sign, you can see it in the arrow there. You would be able to see fluid there. Common ocular tumors can be differentiated, melanoma, carcinoma, hemangioma. In a melanoma, you will find the collar button shape, acoustic shadowing behind, and you will see choroidal excavation. In a retinoblastoma, you will see calcification that will give you a 100% A-scan spike. In an osteoma, because of the, echo, the shadowing behind, you will get a double optic nerve sign. In choroidal metastasis, the inside will be homogeneously uh, hyper-reflective. Uh, sometimes you get rare things like ocular cysty circus. Here you can see the scolex can be demonstrated, the cyst can be demonstrated inside in an ultrasound B scan. To summarize, when interpreting a B scan, one should be aware of probe position and gain setting. A scan spike in the display should be on for additional information. The location, extent, dimension, shape, and configuration, reflectivity, mobility, and sound attenuation are the characteristics to be looked at. And it's an important tool in our diagnostic armamentarium and should be used when required and findings should be read in conjunction with clinical examination findings. Thank you all for your patient hearing. Thank you very much, Natasha. I think you covered every possible question which could be asked to a postgraduate. Uh, something I think which you already said, 
how do you differentiate an asteroid hyalosis from a vitreous hemorrhage? The postgraduate is asked one single sentence. Uh, yeah, the distribution of the asteroid hyalosis will be in the center of the vitreous with a lucid zone between the vitreous and the retina. And in vitreous hemorrhage, it will be more unevenly distributed and more towards the lower part, and there will be no lucid zone. And the, if you pass a spike exactly through, the, if you pass that vector exactly through the asteroid hyalosis, you will get a 100% spike because of the, um, the content of the asteroid hyalosis. Thank you, Natasha, madam. I think you have covered most of the points which uh, the postgraduate needs to know and you have covered the varied disease as well. So I, I would uh, quickly move on to our uh, mod next moderator, uh, Dr. Guru Prasad, sir. Your uh, quick comments on the postgraduates about this B-scan and uh, a few tips from you, please. Yeah, I, I just uh, want to uh, add that uh, B-scan is a very important tool. Uh, she's already told that, that it has to be always read in conjunction with the clinical findings. And one more thing that we need to uh, stress upon for the postgraduate students that it is a kinetic examination. It's not a, a static examination. It's not just, just like OCT, just like FFA, like you have, want to have different sections in the OCT and different uh, phases in the FFA. You need to have uh, movements with the, the uh, B scan should be uh, spread over the movement of the eye, meaning you should have the mobility. She did mention mobility, but then I think it is better to use the word kinetic examination for the to impress upon the postgraduate students one thing. I think there was a slip of the tongue when she said in METS it will be homogeneous. I think it is heterogeneous in the METS. The internal reflectivity in METS uh, in a choroidal tumor which is a MET will usually be uh, heterogeneous rather than homogeneous. Homogeneous it will be in more in hemangiomas with a high ref uh, internal reflectivity high and sometimes pulsations can be seen. Uh, whereas in uh, METS, it will usually be heterogeneous because there will be uh, de uh, different areas of uh, different densities within the tumor with uh, uh, liquefaction, necrosis, and solid uh, areas within the METS, which gives this heterogeneous uh, appearance. Uh, that's all I wanted to add. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Guru, sir. Jatinda, sir, quick comments, and uh, we move on to our next presenter, Dr. Praveen Murli. Uh, nothing specific. Most of the things were well covered in a very uh, nice presentation. Uh, only thing, just to reiterate, again, don't uh, jump to a diagnosis just by seeing the scan. Uh, just label them as the findings, as what you see. And be very clear that you mention as hyper ecogenicity and not mistakenly uh, label them as hyper reflective. Most people in exams, they, because of the stress factor, they may just uh, jump on hyper reflective. That's because that's a more commonly used term. So, but when you're using uh, describing terms on ultrasound, use eco, hyper, and hypo eco genesity rather than the uh, refractive. That's it. Thank you very much. So, we go on to our next section how to present. And our first speaker here is Dr. Praveen Murli, he's a senior consultant, Vitrio Retina and Uvia at the Kochi branch of uh, Eye Foundation Group of Hospitals with a great academic career, very good uh, surgical prowess. And I'm sure he's going to do a true justice to his talk. On to you, Praveen. Yeah, just before Praveen uh, starts, I just want to tell all the viewers here. So this session is how to present. Basically, they're, they're all the young Turks who are very well established in their field of vitro retina now. They have come up with the, the flying colors in their examination and now they are the uh, young uh, uh, practicing retinologists. So they'll be presenting if a case, say for example, a case of regmatogenous retinal detachment comes, how should be the ideal case presentation? So they'll, they'll try to give you some tips and for, uh, further it will be, the first case will be moderated by Dr. Ennis Murlidhar, sir. So we'll try to add on a few points about what the examiner might ask and what is very important for the postgraduates to know, uh, at least to pass in for the examination when that case is presented. Over to Dr. Praveen, please. Uh, thank you very much, Suryasi uh, and as well as Tikra, madam. So it is mainly for all the students who are preparing for the exam. Even though it's a long time since I cleared my exam, I would like to share the best uh, uh, possible way to give a good presentation. Most of us, uh, before you enter the hall, we know the diagnosis, either by your colleague or from the internal. And same is with the examiner. They also are not interested uh, in you coming to the diagnosis because they also know that you know the diagnosis. However, they are more keen on how you present, whether the way you present is methodical, how you reach to a differential, whether it's in a stepwise manner, 
and how confident are you in presenting the case also before uh, entering you should know your strong points and weak points so that you can insist on those points and or skip those points So uh, this is a 40-year-old male who presented to us with a chief complaint of sudden onset defective vision in his left eye. So the uh, main uh, presenting uh, history is a defective vision, which is sudden onset uh, of a duration of three days, which is progressive and is associated with floaters and flashes, which is a, a prior history, and it is not associated with pain and redness. So this is the main uh, uh, focus for us. And we can re-insist uh, by saying uh, uh, that the patient has a sudden uh, onset of defective vision and a, uh, a painless thing. So when we re-insist, we are uh, forcing the examiner to ask us the question. The most commonly they will ask the next thing is, what is the cause of uh, painless loss in vision? So this is how we lead them to uh, the thing. And you should be happy that you know this answer and you can go ahead, uh, divide into two formats, like it can be either painless or painful. Painful can be acute congestive glaucoma, acute iodidal cyclitis, or painless can be in form of central uh, retinal artery occlusion, ischemic vein occlusion, retinal detachment, or massive hemorrhage. Uh, if you want them to lead again to further question, you can even uh, tell uh, or repeat the thing that preceding to the symptoms of defective vision, uh, there were some brown particles, uh, certain floaters, which uh, was the associated with flashes of light prior to the uh, defective vision. So the next question they may ask is what is the cause of flashes and, or floaters of light? So you can, again, instead of directly going to the answer, you can just uh, tell a little bit about uh, floaters, whether it was black or gray dots, whether there were lines, red light, cobwebs, rings. And this all can depict what is the condition in the eye. Like uh, if it is a dark brown or black with a lot of showers, it can be it, uh, like a, a blood sudden blood in the vitreous or in the AC, which can be PVD induced. A flashes can, you can get either in PVD or migraine, etc. Again, further going to the history, uh, ask for any similar episode, similar episode in the same mm -hmm. eye or the other eye. Ha if the patient had any trauma, there was no history of any uh, redness, mm -hmm. pain, watering, exposure to bright light, UV light, sunlight, no travel history or no other relevant history. I mean, uh, the next part is about the past history. So you can ask again for a similar episode in the same eye or the other eye, or whether the patient had any uh, procedure or any surgical. Uh, the third thing is about the personal history. Uh, go ahead and ask for any systemic illness or any medication also. Uh, family history also similar uh, episode or history of uh, similar illness. Post the history, uh, I'll skip the systemic examination where you have to take about the uh, RS, C, uh, CVS, all the other part, but I'll directly go into the ocular examination. So uh, we go always in a stepwise order. First, you say about the visual equity or the best corrected visual equity, right eye, left eye separately, the intraocular pressure, right eye, left eye. When you come to intraocular pressure, you have to mention whether it's shiots or applanation. Uh, then uh, uh, go ahead with the Eyebrow, look for any signs of trauma, if there are any positive signs. Lid and One minute left. Uh, I request Dr. Praveen, you can move on to the findings directly. So when it uh, comes to uh, finding, uh, go ahead. Uh, when you are presenting, you have to tell in form of uh, fundus examination. Fundus examination. You have to tell uh, whether you are doing it a direct ophthalmoscope, uh, CITLAM 90D or indirect 20D. Direct ophthalmoscope, you have to again mention in form of uh, you are looking at distant direct ophthalmoscopy where in the whether you have seen a good glow or a, a, a dull glow. So dull glow itself suggests mm -hmm. that uh, whether the cataractus is there or whether some pathology is there in the, uh, in the retina or Coming to the uh, fundus picture itself, uh, when you are saying, uh, first say of the normal eye, uh, as a PG, you always have to say that the media is clear. Then you describe the disc. Uh, disc is of uh, normal shape, size. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Praveen. Yeah, and then uh, uh, of the pathological eye, you can say uh, uh, what is the extent of the detachment, whether it's nasal, inferior, superior. Uh, See the amount of detachment, uh, 
uh, say the clock hours involved, how was the surface, and see the patient both in sitting and lying down position to see for any change in uh, fluid level. And the last is after all this, you uh, describe what is the differential or go ahead with the diagnosis. Diagnosis like uh, this patient was left acute sub uh, subtotal, like mutagenous retinal detachment involving the intranasal, supranasal, supratemporal quadrant with macula on or off. And Praveen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Praveen. Uh, though it was a very short time, uh, I apologize for that because uh, because we had to discuss a little bit more about uh, many of the other cases as well. So I think I would like Dr. N.S. Mudlidhar, sir, and uh, Dr. Praveen to please uh, moderate this uh, case presentation. Yeah, I think Praveen covered very well uh, many points uh, in the history regarding the onset, the history of flashes, floaters, some more things I would uh, say when I am presenting a case of retinal detachment, I would say that I have asked for ocular history, whether patient was wearing glasses, whether the patient is a high myope. This is something we have to ask the patient, whether the patient has history of ocular surgery or a YAG capsulotomy in the recent past. This is something we can say. I have asked and the patient does not give history of this then history of trauma, either a major trauma or even a trivial trauma. We all know that patients with high myopia, even with a trivial trauma, can develop a retinal detachment. And uh, important thing is, what was the vision of the patient before the onset of detachment? Because often we see unilateral high myopes with amblyops, amblyopia developing a retinal detachment. So it's important to document that the patient's vision was good or not good before you know, before you develop the retinal detachment. These are some of the points which you might want to tell the examiner, you know, that, okay, patient had good vision in the eye. He has history of no way, not no history of wearing glasses in the past. He enjoyed good vision, no history of ocular surgery, no history of trivial trauma, no history of yak capsule, blah, blah, like these, some of the points. And uh, family history of retinal detachment is an important negative thing that you have to elicit from the patient. Past history of myopia, trauma, ocular surgery, that I think we have covered. So when it comes to the retinal detachment description, you have to describe the extent of retinal detachment, total, subtotal, involving three quadrants, two quadrants. And most important is presence of tears, retinal breaks. Retinal breaks, you should describe what is the meridian of the break, what is the type of break, whether it's a horseshoe tear, and whether it is, what is the size of the break? It is a small horseshoe tear or a big horseshoe tear or a large hole or a small hole in which meridian, whether it's in the equatorial region or anterior to equator or posterior to equator. And what are the number of breaks, whether additional pathologies present like lattice degeneration, uh, these are some of the things and presence of other uh, associated things like PVR, presence of star folds, presence of subretinal bands. And if there is PVR, you should be able to grade the PVR at least according to the earlier retina society terminology. You may not be expected to you know, uh, grade the RD according to the latest you know, silicon study terminology or something like that. At least the earlier terminology of A, B, C, D, C1, C2, C3, and D1, D2, D3. At least that much knowledge the, the candidate should be able to tell, you know, should be able to exhibit. So uh, I think I have finished my comments, yeah. I'd like to say uh, 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 only one more point I would like to ask is pseudo fake guy, then you must examine the anterior segment and comment on the status of posterior capsule, whether the posterior capsule is intact or broken, whether the IOL is stable, well centered or decentered, because during surgery, this all pose may pose a lot of problems. Thank you. I'd like to point uh, yes, uh, yeah. See, uh, when you talk about sudden uh, vision loss you have to differentiate that from sudden detection. Sudden detection is that he closed the other eye and found he couldn't see from the other eye. Sudden deterioration means that you were seeing with both eyes. You till yesterday you saw you were seeing and suddenly you see in front of your, uh, in front of you, the vision in one eye starts dropping. The two are very different. Sudden detection occurs in amblyopic eyes. So you have that or a pre-existing uh, eye, uh, uh, an eye with a pre-existing low vision. So it's a it's an uh, indicator of prognosis. So it's very important to make one this differentiation. The second thing is, 
for a rigmatogenous detachment, the detachment has to come up to the aura. So when you say that when you're trying to make your diagnosis, you will have to say that this, uh, this retinal detachment came up to the aura. If it did not come up to the aura, it is a tractional detachment. So that is another point. The other thing, because the features which will differentiate a tractional detachment or an exudative detachment from a rheumatogenous detachment have to be said in your examination. So for example, when you say that the surface of the retina was corrugated, it was not smooth bullous. When you say smooth bullous, it signifies your th thinking in terms of a exudative detachment. When you say corrugated, then you're talking in terms of stage B rheumatogenous detachment. So that differentiation has to come. And of course, based on on the location of the detachment, then you have to point out whether with Linkoff's rules or if you couldn't find the brakes, by Linkoff's rules, are the brakes going to be there only? Or if you found the brakes, do the Linkoff's rules and the preposition of the brake explain the detachment? These points must be brought out when you talk about your uh, case. Thank you. Excellent job. Excellent job. Don't forget the other eye. Don't forget the other eye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Praveen. All the postgraduates, I think, here need to understand that what we have in this panel, that is the how to present, like Dr. Praveen, who is a senior consultant, we try to bring down to your level and try to you know, make the presentation, try to make the best out of you. We are all putting in efforts. I, I really uh, appreciate uh, Dr. Praveen to you know, uh, though he has passed the exams long back, but again, we had to come back to the what are the uh, how's the ideal way to present and all these things. I really appreciate your efforts, Dr. Praveen. Thank you so much for volunteering. Um, uh, over to Dr. Chitra, madam, for the next uh, presenter. I think uh, next presenter, next presenter should we be... have. I think Dr. Divakant had some issues in the family at the uh, uh, attend uh, some urgent things in the family. So we have Dr. Madan Joshi here, who is the registrar at uh, MM Joshi Eye Institute. Who is a young, sincere, dynamic, though a little bit introvert, but very soon is going to be a prolific uh, vitreoretinal surgeon in Bellari. Over to Dr. Madan, please. And, uh, I request uh, Dr. Uh, Dinesh Talwar, sir, to please uh, moderate this case. And even before he presents, we need to appreciate the fact that he was given a half an hour notice uh, to present his talk. So let's hear from him. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, So I'll be presenting a case of a 54 year old gentleman who came with complaints of uh, decreased vision in the left eye since three weeks, which was uh, gradual and painless. And he also complains of uh, decreased vision in the right eye, which was gradual, but it was less significant than the left. He was using reading glasses since 10 years and there was no history of pain or redness or no history of flashes or floaters. He's a known case of diabetes since uh, 12 years on oral hypoglycemics. Attender say, uh, tells that the diabetes is not under control for the last two, three years. And there is no history of any surgeries or any other systemic illness in the past or no history of any eye treatment in the past. So both mother and father are known case of diabetes. Uh, personal history is normal. There are no habits. So moderately built and nourished with the stable vitals and systemic examinations are with the normal habits. So coming to ocular examination, the right eye, uh, best corrected visual acuity is 6 by 12, N8 with plus 2.75. And uh, Litz and Adenex are within normal limits. I want to highlight a few things uh, for the postgraduates here. Uh, if, you, if you are presenting a case of diabetic retinopathy or any posterior segment case, uh, you need to focus mainly on uh, more on neovascularization and RAPD and intraocular pressure and vision. These four things you should never forget. And even gonio, if you're presenting a case of diabetes. So anterior segment findings were within normal limits in this in this patient with uh, normal intraocular pressures and left eye best corrected visual acuity was uh, one by thirty six, and the anterior segment findings were within normal limits. So uh, coming to fundus examination, this is a fundus examination of the right eye. Media is clear. Uh, disc uh, is uh, zero. Uh, CDR ratio is zero point uh, six to zero point seven with healthy N NRR. AVR ratio is two is to three. And uh, coming to background changes, uh, there is a neovascularization of the disc. It's almost extending from uh, six to, you can see here, uh, from six to almost two, two clock hours. And uh, the neovascularization of the disc, and around one disc diameter uh, away from inferior uh, nasal to the 
vessel, you can see a neovascularization uh, uh, with uh, fibrovascular proliferation around one disc diameter in the sides um, with background uh, dot blot hemorrhages in all the quadrants and the flame shaped hemorrhages along the inferotemporal arcade. And uh, I'm sorry for the bad picture, but uh, there is a macular edema uh, with uh, hard exudates. So coming to the left eye examination, uh, this is a uh, uh, media is clear and the disc can be faintly seen, a disc appears perfused. Uh, and uh, there is extensive fibrovascular proliferation along the around uh, in the posterior pole. And uh, you can see here neovascularization and uh, we have few collaterals, a uh, few collaterals uh, in the superior temporal uh, part of the fungus. And uh, there is uh, in the periphery, in, inferiorly, there is vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, here, mainly for the postgraduate, uh, post uh, you should be well versed with the diagrams. And the color coding is very important if you are presenting a case of uh, diabetic retinopathy. So you must be eluous with the uh, color coding. So coming to uh, diagnosis, uh, right eye uh, SIMC with proliferative diabetic retinopathy with macular edema and left eye uh, NS2 cortical with proliferative diabetic retinopathy with TRD with vitreous hemorrhage. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Madan, uh, for preparing in uh, just a half an hour's time, as Chitra Madam said. Uh, over to, where is Dinesh, sir? Yeah, hi. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank yes, you very yes, much. Sir. I think you've done a great job for sir, uh, the time. Sorry. That... I'm muted. Am I muted? No, no, no. I, I, I have kept it. Go ahead. Yeah, so for the, for the short duration that you've been given, you've done a great uh, job of giving us the essential seeds of what we need for a presentation. Uh, as mentioned, the most important thing is that you must not miss about uh, relative afferent pupillary defect. So therefore, your first examination has to be before dilation. And then only the dilation is done. The second thing is that you have to look for neovascularization. And then that is not just neovascularization of the iris, which is not just at the pupil, but also at the angle. So both have to be looked at. So gonioscopy is an es essential part of this examination, especially the, the kind of case you presented where one eye vision was less, significantly less. But before you come to that, uh, all cases won't be such severe ones. So when you talk about the history, it's very important to go a little more into the history. See, in diabetics, what you get is macular edema as the commonest thing, and then PDR as the second thing. So what would the patient come with? Not just blurring of vision. The second thing would be micropsia. So you must know whether there's a history of micropsia and you must note it down. The second thing is a history of floaters because that's the key to you that there has this patient may have gone up to the stage of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So, <clears throat> so this is the other important thing. The third thing is whether this has been a constant thing or there's been fluctuation. Fluctuation is likely to happen with the vitreous hemorrhage. A constant slow decrease is likely to happen with a diabetic macular edema. The last thing is about near vision. If the patient says his near vision has been going, this is preferentially a sign of a macular disorder. So that's another sign that tells you that there's something wrong. Your vision must be both. It's not, you're not going to do a pinhole vision only. If you get a pinhole vision, you must also do a BCVA in your patient because pinhole vision in macular disorders is less as compared to the unaided vision. So this is the other important thing. As far as the history is concerned, you also need to check for hypertension, nephropathy, cardiac disease, drug allergies, because you may be doing a first in angiography for this patient. Bronchial asthma. These are some of the things which I would do as a routine to make sure we don't miss this when we do the when we go ahead for investigation of the patient. The, sec, the, the next thing is extraocular muscles. Patients with diabetes, it's not just a diabetic retinopathy, you could also get a sixth nerve palsy. So you must also check out for the extraocular muscle movements and uh, so that you don't miss that. When you come to the fundus, the cup must be looked at. Diabetics are also more prone to glaucoma. So in the process of looking at diabetic retinopathy, should not forget about glaucoma. So this is one part. The second thing is now when you come to the changes, 
the important thing is you're looking clinically and you have to differentiate this clinical examination. Does this patient need, for example, a fluorescein angiography? So now, if the patient has, <coughs> has severe or very severe NPDR, how will you diagnose that? So you have to see, does he have microaneurysms or retinal hemorrhages in all four quadrants at the posterior pole? One sign. Whether he has venous beading, easily found. Whether he has irmas, difficult sometimes to pick up, but look carefully for tortuous vessels, which seem to sort of form a, um, a cluster. The vessels per se being very fine, less than 31 micron in diameter. These are the signs that tell you you're dealing with severe and very severe NPDR. Patients who need to be taken up for a, you may want to take a fluorescein angiography so that you don't miss an early PDR in these patients. So this is the other important thing. So these are some of the things which we need to do before we come to a final diagnosis. Of course, if you have severe fibrovascular proliferation, as you had in this case, so it's clear cut, there's not much of a problem. The problem comes in severe NPDRs with macular edema. There, your description has to be complete. So you don't miss something. I think that uh, <clears throat> that's just to add to whatever you talked about, the more severe varieties of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. In, you, in uh, connect with what you are talking, Dr. Dinesh, even if it's an asymmetric diabetic retinopathy, as it probably was in this case, you should also think of some uh, cardiac and carotid disorders also. Exactly. So if you, this is the other thing, very, that's very, very good uh, point. If you see asymmetry between the two eyes, then you have to look for the cause. So the cause could be the patient's hypertensive. That could be one. The patient may have pseudophakia in one eye. That eye could have a more, more severe disease process. So these are the things which need to be looked at also. Also, if the flame-shaped hemorrhages are more and dot hemorrhages are less, then this is more of a component of hypertensive retinopathy. This is not diabetic retinopathy. So this is that means the combined picture has more of an element of hypertensive retinopathy within. So these are some of the other things too. Mixed retinopathy is what we usually mention. It is. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that point. And usually asymmetric retinopathy, when we also do it, when the patient is not having DR changes, but having DR changes in other eye, in those cases, we usually have to rule out uh, OIS as well. We have to do a carotid Doppler in these cases to rule out what's the stenosis of the carotid arteries. Uh, I think we'll we'll come to the end of that and we'll go on to the next uh, speaker. Yes, over to Chitra, madam, please. Thank you, Dinesh, sir. Thank you, Dr. Madan. Wonderful case. Yeah, wonderful case and wonderfully discussed. Our next speaker is Dr. Giriraj Vibhuti, who's a consultant with your retina at the prestigious M.M. Joshi Eye Institute, besides being a visiting consultant to various cities with multiple national and international awards for his surgical videos. Let's hear from you, Dr. Giriraj. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to Dr. Srinivas sir and Chitra ma'am and team ARC for this opportunity. Uh, okay, uh, I'll try to finish within the time given to me. Uh, let's start with the case. Uh, okay, uh, this uh, Mr. A.B. who presented to us, uh, who is a 65-year-old gentleman, a shopkeeper from Hubli, who presented to us with complaints of diminution of vision, which he noticed since last one month. According to him, he was apparently normal till one month when he developed diminution of vision in his left eye, which was uh, which he noticed suddenly and it was painless progressed over last month and it worsened since last one week. Patient hasn't consulted any doctor prior to this. He didn't have any similar complaints in the past. There is no uh, similar complaint in his other eye, no history of trauma or no history of using thick glasses. As we are presenting a retina case, uh, the history of thick glasses becomes more important. Uh, no history of flashes or floaters, no history of headache and no history of COVID related illness. This has become important in current times. Uh, patient is uh, recently diagnosed hypertensive. He was started on antihypertensives just 15 days before. He is not a diabetic, not on any uh, prolonged medications. Uh, personal history, sleep, appetite is normal, bowel and bladder habits are regular, uh, no, addi uh, no addictions. And family history is not significant. 
uh, general examination was uh, normally was moderately built and nourished well oriented pulse was 82 beats per minute regular and rhythmic his bp as uh, he is recently diagnosed hypertensive still it was 170 by 90 mm of mercury in sitting position no pickle and systemic examination was normal uh, coming to ocular examination uh, starting with head posture facial symmetry and ocular movements they were fully uh, normal and uh, Uh, conventionally, I will uh, mention the right eye findings first. His uncorrected visual acuity was six by thirty-six, which was improving till six by twelve with refractive correction. Uh, Adnexa, conjunctiva, cornea were normal. Iris was uh, normal. Uh, coming to the uh, important features of the left eye, his visual acuity was two by thirty-six, which was not improving. Uh, cornea, adnexa, conjunctiva were normal. Again, uh, I, I want to concentrate on iris. There was no NVI. Uh, it was normal in pattern pupil was round regular and there was no uh, rapd in this case lens showed nuclear sclerosis grade 2 cataract anterior vitreous face was normal gat again important finding uh, me measured at 2 uh, 2 pm it was 16 mm of mercury so conventionally uh, the right eye even though it appears appeared normal we should uh, look at the vessels also vessels showed a few av nicking signs uh, which were suggestive of grade 2 hypertensive retinopathy and coming to the uh, eye proper uh, the examination eye proper uh, in the left eye uh, the media was clear optic disc was normal in size shape color pattern and uh, uh, and the uh, neuro retinal rim was healthy the margins were well made out uh, as we can see uh, in the diagram there were uh, multiple uh, superficial and deep hemorrhages which were straddling along the superior temporal arcade mainly uh, they were mainly inside the arcade but uh, few hemorrhages were outside the arcade also and few were in the macular area also on the 90d slit lamp biomicroscopic examination we could see uh, the foveal elevations uh, and without any foveal reflex suggestive of macular edema so uh, this is the fundus picture of that patient and uh, we can see uh, venous dilatation also uh, so coming to diagnosis proper uh, my diagnosis is left eye superior temporal branch retinal vein occlusion with macular edema with grade 2 hypertensive retinopathy and the incidental finding of nuclear sclerosis grade 2 cataract right eye had nuclear sclerosis grade 2 cataract with grade 2 hypertensive retinopathy thank you nice presentation very nice thank you dr giriraj uh, for quickly presenting a case of uh, brvo Uh, I now request uh, Dr. Lalit Verma sir to please uh, moderate the case. Excellent, uh, Vibhuti. You have just presented like a resident, although you are a consultant. I know that's the beauty of uh, your presentation. I would not be able to add much, but except that uh, you know, once I am talking of hemorrhages, I may tell that it is predominantly superficial hemorrhages and the numbers also, because sometimes the number of hemorrhages may give a, a clue to the ischemic process going on. and i would also mention there are no soft exudates there because of you say again will reflect ischemia and i would also say the horizontal raphe is respected so sometimes this even though it may be a branch as well block sometimes it may have a component of hemispheric block also you rightly emphasized uh, iop and uh, rubiosis and other things that was very nicely done av changes also like right eye you said uh, has uh, uh, some hypertensive retinopathy uh uh history wise i think uh, something more needs to be maybe you know deciphered because if we, if we are talking only of uh, only of uh, ocular condition or some systemic conditions because uh, we also need to remember that a lot of these vascular blocks may have a hidden cardiac uh, issues or systemic issues also so those also sometimes we have to decipher and add and also if you are if somebody if some jr junior is presenting history of any investigations done in the past or treatment history because a lot of people nowadays jump to injections uh, as soon as they see any any macular pathology or any vascular pathology in the eye so we do you know sometimes you can you can tailor the examiner to ask questions into nt wagers or this also so uh, like he hasn't received any injection in the past or or uh, a lot of these vascular blocks specifically brvos and small vessel blocks may be just any simple finding which uh, you know uh, may be detected only on closure of one eye if they are not hampering vision too much otherwise excellent job done and uh, from the residency point of view but investigations are very important because one vascular event in the eye means vascular event in the body has to be ruled out 
which may be which may be cardiac you have to uh, somebody has to tell some uh, you know cerebral vascular some people have to tell it does not have any history of this 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 so that examiner knows that you are aware that vascular event in the eye means it could have correlation with the autoimmune disease brain disease or or you know giant cell arthritis sometimes over the age of 50 60 people may you know although more commonly as a central crvo but sometimes any vascular block can present so sometimes brvo can convert to you know crvo also thank you thank you lalit sir for uh, nicely uh, telling out spelling out a few more points which the uh, examiner or uh, might ask and the student have to answer jatinder singh uh, sir singh uh, we have one more minute you want to add uh, i think uh, uh, all the cases which have been presented i mean brvo and uh, diabetic retinopathy especially uh, one important history that is there is as uh, dr varma said uh, about this history of taking injections so the history that should be a uh, history of any treatment should be uh, in significant detail uh, that is the number of injections taken the time gap between the injections given in uh, each eye if it is given in, uh, bilaterally and uh, following the injection uh, was there any improvement or not uh, time since the last injection and uh, probably a clue to what injection has been used even the, just the cost uh, sometimes the patient doesn't know the name of the injection Just the cost of the injection, though it's quite variable based on different cities, uh, that itself can give a clue to what injection has been used and whether it was changed uh, to give an indication whether the treatment I mean, was uh, the patient condition was responding to treatment or not. The non-responsive edema again, we need to look out into other history. There is uncontrolled hypertension, nephropathy, as sir has already mentioned. Uh, in addition, uh, history of using uh, glitazones, thiazolidine, diones, drug history. that also should be uh, probed into and uh, i think uh, more uh, uh, like uh, important is to uh, recognize whether the conditions patient's condition is just a usual easily treatable kind of condition or a difficult uh, case scenario that has to be uh, brought out uh, from the history and uh, then it gone from the corroborated with the examination any history of laser done because brv is normally a lot of people you know after a couple of injections add laser also just to minimize the number of injections what i was trying to say is you can tailor your uh, description or verbal uh, whatever you are presenting so as to tailor uh, tell the examiner that you have asked investigations treatment any angiograms is carrying or you know they are carrying some uh, pictures of oct that will make the job easier so otherwise wonderful job done giraj thank Any you questions uh, can i just want to add a point uh, about the covid uh, history that he took yes. Uh, we have had several cases of uh, yes. uh, covid fever in the past coming with vein occlusion sometimes arterial occlusion and vitreous frank vitreous hemorrhage also and i think we have seen close to 10 to 12 patients now i think it's important and relevant in the present scenario to take a history of uh, covid fever in all these venous occlusions yes. or arterial occlusions rightly pointed out thank you sir thank, thank you thank you uh, and uh, uh, one more point uh, dr joshi one point. can i highlight one more point i think that yeah, yeah. Uh, description the whether the hemorrhages are respecting a particular uh, quadrant uh, has to be emphasized if the hemorrhages are not limited to a particular quadrant or a particular geographical location horizontal refe then uh, uh, the history of other things i mean uh, even uh, a patient with uh, young uh, uh, branch vein occlusion uh, you have to look into other history also uh, like uh, the yeah. uh, branch retinal artery occlusion can be associated with sussex syndrome and those kind of things also may need to be probed into uh, that thank you. thank you thank you sir that was a very good discussion so we go on to our next speaker dr vishal govindari who is a consultant vitreo retina and uvr services at lvpi bhuvaneshwar with his area of uh, main clinical interest in diseases of macular myopia and newer imaging modalities he would be discussing a case of retinitis pigmentosa on to you doctor yeah uh, thank you vishal i think now he is the the consultant at uh, pushpagiri vitoretna uh, institute at hyderabad over to dr vishal it's so sorry thank you thank you chitra i should have asked you uh, thank you shrinivas sir for the opportunity uh, instead of a routine case i just uh, wanted to uh, highlight the important checkpoints at uh, you know a given case presentation of retinitis pigmentosa considering sir, the... uh, your your voice is very feeble i don't know if i am hearing that now? can you hear me now uh no Little, little more louder, please. Can you hear me now? 
Yeah. Much better. Much better now. Yeah. So uh, I would just be looking at the important uh, checkpoints during the case presentation as opposed to presenting a case because uh, I had discussed with uh, Srinivasar and he had given me the freedom of you know discussing what is important. So considering five minutes, here is what I have to present. Um, with respect to demographics uh, and retinitis pigmentosa, so what is very important with respect to age is the majority present between the second to third decade. And the inheritance patterns uh, actually influence the age of onset, while Leber's is a juvenile variant. And with respect to gender, you have the X-link recessive affecting predominantly males. Uh, presenting symptoms invariably include first being night blindness, followed by poor vision, eye ache, and deafness. Visual impairment is more severe in the X-link recessive uh, variant rather than autosomal dominant, compa autosomal recessive compared to autosomal dominant. Photophobia appears later in the clinical spectrum. Contract sensitivity gets, gets affected and dyschromatopsia also gets affected in case of macular involvement. History of present illness is important because it's a very insidious on, onset invariably. It has a very gradual progression, specific complaints with respect to dim light or night activities in early stages, difficulty in driving or activities dependent on visual fields and no diurnal variation impairment as age progresses. Family history is very key. The involved family member, whether parent, sibling, uncle, aunt or grandparent, and the importance of parental consanguinity, as you can see the uh, degrees according to the National Health Scheme of the UK. The mode of inheritance on the right gives you uh, the simplex that is the uh, sporadic variant versus the percentages of different kinds of inheritance. Pedigree charting, which is expected in an RP case, just to simplify it, dominance versus recessive, there's always a skip noted in recessive. Autosomal versus sex link, father to son transmission happens only in autosomal. Y linked, only males are affected. Mitochondrial disorders, mothers alone transmit the phenotype. Excellent dominant, fathers do not transmit to sons and excellent recessive, males are more commonly affected. So this is just a quick uh, representation on how to show the pedigree charting. And this is how dominant where there is no skip, in recessive there is a skip. Excellent dominant where fathers don't transmit to sons and the excellent recessive where males are predominantly involved. Smoking and alcoholism are known to worsen, especially smoking and a combination can lead to lung cancers in case of vitamin A therapy. Systemic history is extremely important considering syndromic associations, ushers with deafness and barred beetle presenting with the obesity, psychomotor delay, hypogenitalia, uh, renal abnormalities and neurogenitary changes. There are a whole host of other diseases like alports, cocaine, a beta lipoproteinemia, mucopolysaccharidosis. These are quite academic, but uh, at least knowing one sign like uh, alports, nephritis, a beta lipoproteinemia having steatoria, and BTs having corneal crystals are something which you know is expected. These are the mitochondrial deficiencies, which uh, disorders which are associated with pigmentary retinopathies. Keen says NARP and MELAS are the three things which are essential. There are a whole host of other associations which are uh, uh, for us to you know uh, remember if required. This is the picture with barded beetle where you have uh, uh, polydactyly and hypogenitalia, while this is a uh, patients with uh, a patient with ushers. Case of visual assessment, you do are uncorrected and best corrected. Color vision gets important in case of optic nerve involvement and the low contrast visual acuity to assess the macular involvement. Nystagmus in case of LCA, RAPD as discussed can occur also in LCA. Extraocular movements in case of mitochondrial involvement and a thorough slit lamp examination. You have these ocular associations like keratoconus, posterior subcapsular cataracts and disc drusen. With the fundus, you have the early stage having, you know, uh, seem, seem uh, apparently uh, featureless retina. Over time, um, you can see the atrophy coming in, the retinal atrophy with the macula being spared. And then the final stage having all the three symptoms of vaccine disc, attenuated vessels and bony spicules. CME, cystoid macular edema, epiretinal membranes and traction are a common association. Uh, a differential diagnosis of gyrate, choroideremia or cone rod dystrophy have to be mentioned. Some infectious pigmentary causes also form the differential like syphilis and uh, DUSN. There are some atypical variants like albipunctatus and uh, the uh, uh, sign pigmento or the sectoral uh, RP, which also have to be known when you are giving your final diagnosis. Among the investigations, unless until you have a diagnostic dilemma, ERG uh, you can pick it up, but if you already have a diagnosis, it's not needed. As shown, early phases where the fundus doesn't show much is the ERG which gives you the diagnosis, but with progression, the photopic response also gets affected. As you can see, the HVF initial scotomas around the 20 degrees, which start to uh, close in on the tunnel, uh, which uh, uh, constricts over time. OCT is being used nowadays to assess cystoid macular edema, to understand uh, traction, and to assess foveal atrophy. Dark adaptometry and EOG are seldom used. 
autofluorescence is one thing which i would add to understand the progression over years with the uh, robson's ring and a multifocal erg in case of vision not explained by the grade of atrophy genetic analysis becomes key to identify the particular mutation and the risk of transmission to offspring to understand the clinical cause and whether there is they are eligible for gene therapy or not with respect to availability of therapy there are a whole host of genes involved with rt the so uh, is is the is is the most common one i'll just take a minute the final diagnosis should ideally be mention a rod rod cone dystrophy rather than rp likely to be rp is a better way to put it mentioning the typical variants and systemic associations in the final diagnosis is essential quick treatment view is just to assess for cataracts macular edema and providing low vision aids vitamin a has been tried along with docosahexaenoic acid but of limited value gene therapy photoreceptor cell death therapy and retinal implants are the way to go with respect to what uh, is expected as you know uh, future uh, prospects with retinitis pigmentosa thank you very good presentation uh, thank you uh, dr vishal i think you gave a overall glimpse but i would like to ask dr gurprasad sir whenever this question comes uh, a case comes to the post graduate what are the must things that he has to answer and he has to know for him to just pass out this yeah i i think you should not have given him the liberty of uh, uh, presenting it differently he has taken away my job he has, <laughs> so he has taken it no worries go okay. ahead <laughs> so yeah i'll probably restrict myself to what the questions might be asked i think uh, they might ask what are the causes of night blind <clears throat> what are the causes of night blindness so i think um, kinetics should be very familiar with uh, what are the causes of night blindness like vitamin a deficiency myopia glaucoma cataract cirrhosis uh, and all those things then the, the question will come whether is dealing with a primary pigmentary degeneration or a secondary pigmentary degeneration so i think age comes to the rescue if it is if the patient is young then probably it's a it's a it's secondary one uh, primary is usually the ones which are uh, you know uh, inherited uh, either sporadically either it's either sporadic or inher inherited autos autosomal dominantly or uh, recessively or x linked and therefore uh, the um, because the uh, sporadic ones are the most common probably the second the primary ones are the most sporadic ones if it is elderly then probably the differential diagnosis of paraneoplastic disease will probably come ophthalmic artery occlusion and uh, other uh, i think uh, he already uh, mentioned the differential diagnosis of diffuse uveitis syphilis paraneoplastic syndromes i think that uh, I, i don't know whether he mentioned that scar and mar can present in the elderly as a sudden onset of night blindness and loss of vision um, uh, did you mention that uh, doctor govindhari i did not mention that. okay so that is one differential like drug, drug toxicity is another thing cirrhosis is one thing that can uh, masquerade as retinitis pigmentosa spontaneously reattached retinal detachment and dusn i think these are the things which can be listed in the differential diagnosis of retinal of uh, retinitis pigmentosa erg i think uh, it's important to know what the erg findings are in a patient with uh, retinitis pigmentosa and uh, it's important to know that even carriers can have b wave delay and the variants you already told the sec sectoral ones involving one or two quadrants central rp pericentral rp unilateral rp all these things are some things uh, sort of certain things that should be known by the candidate uh, i think uh, the other things you have mentioned very well uh, the syndromic associations the secondary ones uh, basically what uh, primary means is that uh, retinitis pigmentosa which is not associated with any systemic illness or systemic syndrome and second is the one which is associated with the, the syndromic associations bardet beetle which is uh, yeah like he listed out very well uh, at least one characteristic of each of these syndromic associations one should know uh, i think uh, he has done a very good job in um, in in presenting the case and also telling about what is important in the presentation what one should know i think there's not much for me to add to what dr govindari already has told yeah thank you uh, guru prasad sir uh, uh, for that uh, uh, view points which i think the post graduate must know to pass in any case given as retinitis pigmentosa and overall view has been given very nicely by vishal uh, thank you vishal thank you guru sir uh, we'll go ahead with the next talk dr shrinivas uh, can i just make a quick yeah, yeah, please, point here please, uh, please, please. Uh, i think um, the whole objective of this session uh, it was quite clear uh, but uh, i have a small disagreement that it should be just to pass exams 
I think uh, the main focus uh, should be how would you approach a case when you are sitting alone in an OPD without any help. That is how if you see picture yourself in that situation as a postgraduate and you prepare for that situation, you will not only pass exams with flying colors, but you will also become a good clinician. So yeah, for, for just for, just for any case presentation, not just these four, but any case presentation, I think your history should include uh, the features that you are probably uh, ending up, the diagnosis which you are ending up with, that is to establish the diagnosis, the factors that you are going to establish the diagnosis, then the factors that are going to give you a differential diagnosis, and also to include fact, uh, the atypical features of a disease that you are uh, actually going to discuss in the end. The examination should be comprehensive, uh, starting from anterior to posterior, not excluding uh, extraocular movements or adnexa or anything. Uh, that is mainly to uh, look for any comorbidities that one disease may have. A diabetic patient may have six nerve palsy, as Dr. Talwar had already mentioned. So just not to exclude any or miss out any comorbidities, but also uh, to include or uh, uh, pick up diseases which are coexistent with the disease that is being presented. So you may have one case with multiple uh, uh, factors or multiple diseases like a, uh, diabetes with glaucoma or diabetes with uh, any other uh, coexistent uh, problem. And the end, if you reach the diagnosis, you have already passed most of the cases, I mean, uh, which I have come across. If you have reached the diagnosis without much of uh, like flumbing around, so you have already passed the exam, then you have to just propose the differential diagnosis. And uh, whenever possible, put a differential diagnosis, unless it is very clear cut, discrete diagnosis like retinal detachment, give a differential diagnosis whenever possible. So once you have reached that stage, then it is all theory and whatever is your knowledge you've read through, it will take you through. That's it. Yes, and one freaky examiner can even ask you what is treatable retinitis pigmentosa, and you should have an answer for that too. So we go on to our next speaker, who is none other than our eminent Dr. Srinivas Joshi, and he is going to tell, detail us on anti vegf as they stand today. On to you, Dr. Srinivas. Yes, madam. Are you seeing it in a slide share mode? No. No. One second. I'm sorry for this. You have to go on the slideshow now. We are seeing the... One second. Screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not taking up the slide share. So first, just open the presentation, then do the screen. There is there's a dual screen here, which, which is probably... Not allowed. Well, anyway, we'll go on with the next uh, Piyush uh, talk, madam, and then I'll come back to mine. Just a minute. So our next speaker is Dr. Piyush Bansal, of course, Srinivas will take on again, who's going to be delving into lasers in retina. And Dr. Piyush is the founder director of Bansal Vision Institute of Pune, at Pune, a very dynamic vitreo retina consultant with an amazing uh, presence and a great future. So on to you, Dr. Piyush. Good evening, man. Thank you. Uh, am I slightly visible? Yeah, you have to be louder. Am I my slides visible? Yes, sir. Ja, can you just speak a little louder, sir? Slides are visible. It's very clearly visible and you're very nicely audible as well. Go ahead, uh, Piyush. Just give me a minute because uh, there's some problem over here as well. Well, I checked earlier, actually. I don't know why. Yes. Okay, so uh, uh, good evening everyone. I'll be talking about uh, lasers in retina. First of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to Dr. Srinivas and uh, Dr. Chitra Ramamurthy for uh, uh, extending the kind invitation to me to be a part of uh, this wonderful uh, update, wherein uh, I have been uh, given an opportunity to brush up with the, a lot of my basics as well. It's been a very long time. So uh, to begin with the presentation, uh, briefly delving into the history of lasers, uh, the description of the first instance of retinal photocoagulation, albeit not with laser, dates back to 400 BC when Socrates first uh, described burns of the retina during a solar eclipse. Uh, later on, German ophthalmologist Mayer uh, Shukravat developed the first solar photocoagulator using a carbon arc a light source. Now, uh, as we all know that uh, laser is the acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Uh, 
uh, laser has some special properties, uh, some of them being that it is nearly monochromatic. Monochromatic means that it is of single wavelength or one color of light. Laser radiation is highly directional and it is produced by a beam that is spatially narrow and has low divergence relative to other light sources. And it is highly coherent. That means every uh, beam is thought to be in phase with another at every point. Now, uh, briefly talking about the laser system and media, it basically has three components, the pumping system, <clears throat> the optical cavity and the lasing medium. The pumping system provides the energy uh, to the atoms of the lasing medium. Uh, this excites energy to high, a high energy state. Uh, this results in amplification of the number of photons and produces the laser. Uh, the source of laser for uh, the pumping system could be of different types, could be uh, flash lamps, laser, electrical discharge, or chemical reactions. Uh, another important part is the presence of a mirror on either sides of the optical cavity. Uh, the mirror on one side is 100% reflective, whereas the mirror on the opposite side is generally 90-95% reflective. This allows for uh, the beam of photons to pass through it as laser and the remaining is <clears throat> reflected back. Now, a laser tissue interaction can be of different types. Uh, the first being photothermal. Uh, now, this includes photocoagulation. Now, what it does is uh, there is an absorption of light by the target tissue, uh, which causes a, a rise in temperature and a resulting denaturation of proteins. Typically, the argon, krypton, or diode uh, frequency doubled NDI lasers cause this type of effect. Uh, the next one would be photoionizing, which includes photo disruption, essentially the 106 nanometer uh, wavelength range. So this high energy light is deposited onto the target tissue, and this causes an acoustic shock wave. This disrupts the treated tissue. Uh, essentially, the use in retina is most, most of a high uh, The NDI laser works uh, via this mechanism. <clears throat> now, the argon blue uh, is a gas laser. Uh, the double frequency NDI laser is a solid state laser. Uh, diode or red laser is a semiconductor laser. And we have uh, the yellow laser, which is a 577 nanometer laser. Uh, briefly going into the ones that are uh, commonly used, uh, the argon green, uh, uh, the argon blue green laser, uh, uh, the, the wavelength is in the blue green spectrum. It absorbs selectively at the RP hemoglobin for capillaries in the inner and outer retina level. Uh, the main adverse effects, however, over here are high intraocular scattering, macular damage if it's done close to the fovea, and there is a chance of a group membrane rupture leading to CNVM. Now, this essentially has been replaced by uh, the green laser, which is double doubled NDI uh, laser, 532 nanometers. Now, this is highly absorbed by hemoglobin and melanin, less so by xanthophyll. Uh, the Pascal laser or a pattern scanning laser, which is a very popular laser now, is one such type of laser, which incorporates multiple pattern short pulse, extremely short duration, uh, 532 nanometer. Navilas is a navigated laser photocoagulator. Again, it is also available in the green uh, laser module, uh, it, which is essentially has been uh, into it. Um, Signal problem, I think. I think we lost him, madam. Yeah. I'll just go ahead with my talk, and once he comes back, uh, Piyush is still there. Piyush? Must be some network issues. Yeah. And we have six more speakers. Yeah, I'll just go ahead with my talk. I'll quickly finish it. Okay. Is it visible, madam? Yes. Yeah. So quickly, I'll run through uh, the part of anti VEGF. Now, why is this question? Because this has already been asked in the exam, you can see here the, what are the various types of anti vegf agents available, what are their pharmacological features, their role, their complication, and what is VEGF trap. This has been asked very recently in the recent papers. So whenever a question is asked like this, you always have to make your points like this, like what's the role of VEGF, type of VEGF, type of anti vegf classification, important, indication, modes, complication. Then you can answer that question very clearly. If it's a 10 marks or 20 marks question, it's always better if you write it in this way so that you will not miss the point here and there. Now, whatever might be uh, the uh, cause of the anti vegf it acts mainly on the triad, three, three important things. One is against the angiogenesis, against the mitogenesis, against the permeability. So these three important, and what are my slides I have done is what you can put it in your exams and you can write it. So what is the role of VEGF? You should all know it's the primary driver for angiogenesis, like it inhibits apoptosis, cell growth, uh, survival of the newly formed vessels. It includes mainly the VEGF A. I'll be stressing mainly on the VEGF A because it's the key regulator for angiogenesis. Now, if you mention what are the types of VEGF A, it's always good. It's a bonus mark. You have VEGF 121, you have 165, 189, and 206. So what are the different anti-VEGFs available? 
Pigatinib sodium was the first one which was available. Then came ranibizumab, bevacizumab, aflibercept, rolizumab. So a little bit of bonus if you answer the newer drugs which are in the pipeline. So how to classify? Just draw a simple diagram like this, uh, a line like this. The one which is inside is intracellular, extracellular. So basically, majority of these like bevacizumab, ranibizumab. Or aflibercept. How do they act by neutralizing activity? That means these are the free-floating VEGFAs, which are which are in the extracellular uh, space, and these they try to attract with the VEGFA and they neutralize so that there will be no VEGFA to sit on its receptor. So that is the first part. So majority of these drugs they act on neutralizing effect. The second part is when they act on the receptor. So that is where it comes is the interference with the VEGF receptor activity. That is when the VEGF already comes and sits on its receptor, then it gets activated. The tyrosine kinase signaling starts. So, what are the drugs which can stop at this level? Is vatanilib and pazopanib, which are still under trial, but it's very important to mention it. Once the tyrosine kinase signaling happens, then what happens? The vasopermeability starts, the proliferation starts, the survival, migration, ultimately leading to angiogenesis. So, these are the important parts and. This is how you have to classify. One is a neutralizing activity. The second one is uh, uh, interference with the VEGF receptor, and third one is the degradation of mRNA. Like if already present, then how we can degrade it so that the further VEGF production doesn't happen at all. So the pigatinib is the first, which of historical importance now, but it's very important to know because it was the first anti-angiogenic agent. So it's a dual mechanism. It acts on anti-angiogenesis and anti-permeability. Then we have bevacizumab. It's a uh, recombinant, mono, uh, humanized monoclonal antibody, which it's a full length. So it can attack most of the isoforms of VEGF. But most importantly, it's always better if you mention it's off-label used in ophthalmology. Then we have the ranibizumab. That is a monoclonal antibody. It's just a fab fragment. So just if you mention it's a monoclonal antibody fab fragment, that is good enough. It was approved in 2006. It's important. Some examiners are keen to ask uh, when was it approved. Uh, it was mainly approved for neovascular AMD. So whenever a question is asked on any of these anti-VEGF, make, make sure that you mention these. So please draw a light chain, a heavy chain. Then it is linked with the disulfide bridge. Okay. To that attaches this antibody fab fragment. Just three things. Light chain. Okay. This is put in the gene of interest. Say any vector. Like I, I just mentioned, like E. coli or any vector, AAV vector, whatever vector it is. So once it goes inside the cell, these selection of clones producing ranizumab protein, the ranizumab protein starts developing. Once you get that protein, then it's the up, uh, upstream process, downstream process before you get a, a, a full molecule. So how does ranizumab acts? Again, three things, inhibits vascular permeability, cell proliferation, endothelial cell migration. So now coming to the indications, there are the variety of indications for these anti-VEGFs. But most important you need to mention is the age-related macular degeneration. You can put n number so that you will get good marks. It's it can be a juxtafovial, subfovial, recurrent CNVM, myopic CNVM, idiopathic CNVM, inflammatory, PCV, refractive macular edema due to vein occlusion, pseudo pseudophagic macular edema. In case of diabetic macular edema, that is the CSME can mention it in case of idiopathic peripheral telangiectasia complicated with CNVM, radiation retinopathy affecting the macula, choroidal mets, in case of ROP as well, Coates disease, VHL disease. Now people are using it in CSR as well. So these are the various other added indications apart from the main indications which I described in the previous slide. So they have started in glaucoma and cornea as well. So mode of delivery is again important. The most important mode of delivery we need to know is the intravitreal. And other thing you need to mention is the episcleral hydrogel implant. That is the sustained drug delivery. Now, few examiners are very keen to ask whether it can be given intravenous or not. Yes, this is the trial called as the SANA trial, where they try to inject systemic avastin in cases of neovascular AMD. Again, it's of historical importance, but it's definitely good to know. If you answer this, the examiner will be more happy when he asks this question. So what are the doses? Lucentis is 0.5 milligram. So always remember, it will always be in 0.05 ml only. So anything happens, it has to happen within this dosage. So uh, the ranibzumab is 0.5 milligram. Avastin is uh, done in 1.25 milligram. Complications, again, you can make a list of complications for these. But important to mention, you should not forget mentioning the endophthalmitis, intraocular inflammation. It can cause regmatogenous retinal detachment. 
vitreous hemorrhage, persistent floaters, raised IOP, RP, tear or rip. Okay. So, bevacizumab, as I said, it's again an advanced, which I third the third type of classification. That is, uh, when you inactivate the messenger RNA, so that it prevents the production of gene products. That is, inhibit the production of the protein. That is the wedge of protein itself. But what are the limitations? It can affect only the futuristic protein products. But what to the wedge of which are already there in the body? So, still the trial is going on on this. So again, uh, answering the question which was asked about the VEGF trap, it's a fusion protein, right? So VEGF R1, R2 with a FC frag fragment of IgG. See, this is R1, R2, FC fragment of IgG. So these are the very simple diagrams which can be drawn in the exam. So why are these called as VEGF trap? Because the VEGF thinks, okay, this is my own receptor. Oh, this is R1, this is R2. This is my own receptor. Let me go and sit on that. Ultimately, it gets trapped. That's why it is named as VEGF trap. It's also called as the decoy receptors. That is R1 and R2 are the decoy receptors. Just an example for you people to remember. So what is this? A decoy Air Force One. We do not know where is uh, Joe Biden sitting here, whether in this plane or this plane. So it's also called as the decoy receptors. So what are the indications? Again, DME, CNVM, vascular occlusions, which has been approved. Intravitreal dosage, it's a, a trade name uh, is called as the ILEA which is 2 milligram. Again, what I mentioned, everything has to be in 0 0.05 ml. So studies, if they ask about the VEGF trap, because they have already asked in that question, so I'm just mentioning that it's important for you in CNVM, you need to know a little bit about V1, V2 studies. Vascular occlusions need to know about Galileo and Copernicus. When DME, then Vivid and Vista. So these are the three important studies which you need to know when the question is asked on VEGF trap. Now, a little bit about uh, newer, longer uh, um, anti-VEGF is the brolicizumab. That's the most clinically advanced single chain antibody fab fragment, which has two FC domain. Okay. So what is important you need to mention here, it's the lowest molecular of all the antivegefs available and relatively number of molecules per injection is higher as compared to this. So the uh, they claim that it's a slightly higher potent as compared to the other antivegefs. So what are the trials for this? Hawk and Harrier. I'll not go into the detail, but the, they have explained that it's a superior reduction in central subphobial thickness. Fewer patients had IRF and SRF as compared to the aflibercept. So something new you need to know is the ranibzumab port delivery system, which is yet to come. It's just like a fuel tank. You just uh, uh, have your full tank and then go for a long drive, something like this. So they are looking into if this can act for at least six months. So that's the rapid, uh, sorry, ranibzumab port delivery system. It's also called as RPDS. So what's the knock on the door? Last two slides. It's abisipar pigol. That is a designed anchoring repeat protein. Then we have farisimab. That's by the Genentech, which is nothing but it's a neutralizing angioprotein 2. And then combercept. That is a, a Chinese molecule which bind to the VEGF A and VEGF B as well as placental growth factor. It is approved as, as of now in China. So squalamine lactate, I have been hearing it uh, right from my uh, undergraduate days, it's like a topical anti vegf agent, which they're trying to do it, but it's not successful. Another thing they're trying is the aflibercept hydrogel depot. It's similar, the six months delivery for the aflibercept. So last slide about biologics or biosimilar, when they ask, please just uh, uh, remember what is important here is a biosimilar is nothing but a biologic that is highly similar to the reference product with no clinically meaningful difference in terms of safety, purity, and potency. Like if you have a Mona Lisa painting, how similar you make the second Mona Lisa painting is just about biologics. That is the biosimilar. It's it's now booming up because of our uh, uh, honorable prime minister uh, trying to make more and more about the generic drugs. See, it has to match the peptide mapping, the CD spectra, the fluorescent spectra, what we call is the secondary structure, tertiary structure. It has to match the uh, the potency and the purity. Purity like it has to undergo the cation exchange, HPCL, that is high performance liquid. So these are all the various things. So it has to be as similar to that of the innovator drug. That itself is the biosimilar. Okay. So the few examples, you have bevazumab as Zybev. We have biosimilar ranibizumab. And that's it. I'll not go into the details of it. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Thank you, Srinivas. That was a brilliant talk. And as an anterior segment surgeon, I was really lashed on every slide of yours. Very, very interesting and useful. Maybe this is not a postgraduate uh, PG related question, but more for my uh, information. Uh, 
when would you think of checking the sending it to the glaucoma surgeon or the uh, iop rise with these would it be with just one odd injection or would it be for with multiple injections you would consider would you consider it more for uh, the one of uh, which gen which group of drugs see uh, usually if the patient is a known case of glaucoma then we usually go, go in for the first choice is anti vegf and not the steroids as well but in those cases uh, uh, usually what we try to do is make, you can make an ac paracentesis try to uh, de decompress the volume and then you can go ahead with the injection of the anti vegf or if the patient is already on the anti vegf then you can always go in through after 5 minutes you can just check for the pulsations of the central retinal artery if there are any of those kinds then you can always try to decompress so that the patient will not go in for the the more glaucoma field defects no no what my my question was are you would you uh, uh, look for glaucoma if there are multiple injections needed or with just one odd injection itself you expect an iop rise uh sorry i'm not getting your question madam you with anti vegfs you won't get an iop rise yeah it's only with steroids you have a problem of uh, um there, there are some studies uh, basic science studies which uh, suggest that uh no, like a lot number of injections when they given numerally after numerable injections acha acha uh, there can be trabecular beam damage and that can cause uh, uh, okay. iop rise even in uh, after anti vegf injections yeah that is where most of them are the basic science studies none of them have shown clinical so very, yeah, it's not a routine this thing and you're not going to do it as a as a clinical practice before when you're starting off the treatment okay. there are a few patients i may, i remember only isolated patients <coughs> whose iop has actually risen following multiple injections otherwise very rare for that to happen yeah. most we see it in the steroids and not in anti vegf yeah so brilliant talk uh, there's no questions for you uh, we shall go on to our uh, next speaker dr piyush will you take on from where you had left because we do have uh, piyush most... you have to start from where you have left left not from the beginning no <laughs> and we have six more speakers so we'll have to sadly because you don't want us to have dinner no? <laughs> oh we I mean discussions might have to be sadly curtailed we should have been more sparing initially mm -hmm. i do want to do justice to all the other speakers so start off dr piyush yes so uh i just spoke about a uh, yellow laser which was 577 nanometers it had uh, it has good penetration through uh, media opacity and less absorption by xanthophyll so uh, treatment can be achieved closer to the fovea now various laser delivery systems are available uh, the most common one being uh slides are not shown uh, am i audible oh, yeah yeah your slides are not seen but you can still go ahead piyush okay so uh, uh the, the most common one being a uh, slit lamp laser delivery system which is comfort comfortable mode for the doctor and the patient uh, the next one would be uh, a fiber optic cable uh, attached uh, to an indirect ophthalmoscope this is essentially very useful for uh, treating peripheral lesions uh, the third would be endophotocoagulation that is uh, uh, used during uh, laser during, during surgeries during vitrectomies uh, uh, for retinal detachment and for uh, vascular disorders Uh, these are the various lenses that are used for laser delivery uh, now it's important to remember that the image magnification and the laser spot magnification changes according to the type of laser used either for uh, uh, a prp or for macular laser the parameters that one has to keep in mind are the power spot size duration interval and the number of burns uh, this is a gradation of the density of coagulum which changes depending on the uh, on the condition being treated now uh, coming to the common indications uh, pan retinal uh, photocoagulation uh, is the most common uh, indication and uh, uh, the re uh, it is uh, uh, the most common indications for prp being uh, pdr severe npdr ischemic crvo uh, okay ischemic syndromes and peripheral uh, disorders uh, now coming to proliferative diabetic retinopathy what is what happened am i slide seen no not seen i couldn't understand why seen was let you off no uh, uh, piyush what we can do is we'll finish you you just figure it up we'll finish this talk and we'll come back again because there is some problem we are not able to see your slides all right could hear you i know this is uh, unfortunate so yeah, we so should go we'll ahead with the next we'll come back yeah, to uh, yeah our next speaker is uh, in the next section how to approach 
is Dr. Dipti Kulkarni, who is a consultant vitreo retina surgeon with areas of interest in dioptic retinopathy, preventable retinal blindness, ROP, glaucoma, and is an essential part of a team at the AMEA Lasers and Research Private Limited. She is going to be talking on how to approach viral retinitis. On to you. Um, I've tried to address this mammoth of uh, viral retinitis in a small bunch of slides. First of all, why is it important to know about viral retinitis, both from our OPD practice point of view and exam point of view? Mainly, the diagnosis is clinical. All the tests that we do are either to support this or to confirm it if we want to do it. And secondly, if not treated, this can spread rapidly and cause permanent debilitating blindness in a matter of days and weeks and sometimes hours if uh, RD develops. Now, this is the real reason why we need to know about uh, various viral retinitis. This is a bunch of uh, photos which has a few cases of viral retinitis, infective retinitis, and some are even non-infective cases. So when we don't know or when we are not aware of what we are trying to look at, everything will look the same, red and white. So these are the actual uh, cases that I had uh, posted in the previous slide. Let's just move on. In the history, we must make it a point to note that the vision loss in, the, in these cases will be sudden and severe. There will be some amount of pain, uh, mild or severe, depending upon the condition. The patient can complain that he has a pain while moving his eyes. Photophobia can be there. We must make it a point to note the immune status of the patient. If he's already a known case of HIV, then a CD4 count must be uh, documented or noted. The, the patient might give a history of herpes simplex or zoster. If not, then we must ask and make a, make, make a note of it. Now, what are the differential diagnoses that we are looking at when we are looking at cases of viral retinitis? The viral retinitis can either be necrotizing or non-necrotizing. The necrotizing ones are ARN, PORN, and CMV retinitis. And herpes can also cause a non-necrotizing type of picture. The other uh, DDs that we must look at here uh, are toxoplasmosis, syphilis, pichets, and like I shared in the previous slide, other things, other uh, diagnoses that can give us a red and white picture. I have added small tidbits of what we must study uh, as we go along in the slides. All of us know that these ha these are the highlights that we have to look at when we study or any case. But what I want to stress here is that we must know the differential diagnosis, not just for the entire picture, but for each finding per se. I'll elaborate as we go. This is again another Pehchan cone. There are two uh, photos here of infective retinitis or viral retinitis and two which are not infective at all. So let's first uh, look at CMV retinitis. Cytomegalovirus is again a type of uh, herpes virus which is slowly progressive. We must note here that this mostly occurs in immunocompromised individuals where the CD4 count is less than 50. Patients will complain of a drop in vision which is sudden and severe like I said. Sometimes when the cytomegalovirus is of the indolent variety where the lesions are peripheral, the uh, drop in vision might not be as severe as we expect. This is classically called a pizza pie or cheese and ketchup appearance because of uh, the retinal whitening and the hemorrhages. In cases of congenital infection, we must also note for presence of fever, anemia, and or pneumonia, hepatosplenomegaly. And although, uh, even if we, uh, even if the cases uh, don't show retinal uh, involvement at the outset, they need to be monitored because the retina can be involved even at a later time. The clinical find, the findings have uh, are uh, either there is mild or very absent vitreitis. Um, the white lesions are the uh, cottonwood or cottonwood like spots which are the areas of active retinitis and they spread with a leading edge uh, where there is interretinal hemorrhage. Papillitis and vascular sheathing are uh, prominently noted here. And in many cases, when the patient has not presented to us early on, we can see him directly in the stage of uh, like metrogenous RD. Now, uh, CM, we can I have two presentations, either a classic uh, or a fulminant one, or the peripheral or granular one. In the classic uh, presentation, the posterior pole uh, is mostly involved. It is very aggressive and large hemorrhages with uh, wide areas of necrosis are seen. And in the peripheral uh, presentation, this is a lesser aggressive version. Uh, there is little or no hemorrhage. And after healing, there is a, a presence of uh, pigmentary changes. At this point, I would like to say here that we must know other causes of pigmentary changes that, uh, that are seen in the retina. But the photography is essential here because we want to monitor uh, to know the progression or the uh, effect of our treatment. HIV testing and CD4 count I've already mentioned. 
Uh, PCR testing is just to confirm our diagnosis. But in, if we want to confirm the diagnosis in children, then PCR of the urine or saliva is done. And if required, then subretinal fluid. Your slides are not moving. Okay. Uh, okay. Can are they moving now? No, no, it is still stuck in the cytomegalovirus retinitis. The first slide. Okay. So I'll escape this and I'll go like this. Is this okay? Yeah, sure. Up the screen yeah. share and you can share it again. Yeah, okay, okay. Sorry for this. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. No worries. So I would like uh, Dr. Murlidhar, sir, to uh, please moderate after this talk. So I had reached uh, the stage where I was showing this, where the fundus photography was required for monitoring uh, both the progression of the disease and also the effect of our treatment. CMB can also press... Uh, Dr. Kulgarni, your screen is not visible. Screen is not seen. Can you just stop share and still start again? You can do yeah, it yeah, sir. Because the bandwidth, I think, is not allowing you to slide share and also uh, beam your video. Maybe okay. stop your video and uh, just uh, share yeah, yeah. I think okay. it will help you in presentation. Yeah, yeah. Is it visible now? No, no doctor. It was visible uh, earlier on. It is, I can see it as your sharing screen. No, but it's not visible. Uh, uh, so, Sunil, I think, is it something to do with the bandwidth? Uh, yes, sir, and probably she will have to log off and log in again. Oh. Okay, I'll do that. I mean, while you can carry on with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, next, easy. Madam Chirumali, yeah. Madam Chitra, Madam. Yeah, we'll go to the next speaker and we'll come back to you, Dr. Dipti. Uh, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Tirumalesh, who's going to be delving on post-op endophthalmitis, which is definitely going to interest us all. Is a leading vitreoretina surgeon with special interest in minimally invasive vitreous surgeries and complex retinal procedures from Nara Netralia, Bangalore. On to you, Dr. Tirumalesh. Uh, you could share. Thank you. Uh, I, I hope my uh, slides are visible. Yes, yes, yes. Go into the slide shared, uh, Thiru. Yeah. See. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, uh, Dr. Srinivas, Dr. Yes. Uh, I'll be talking about post-operative end of thalmitis, and the topic that was given to me was how I manage. So why I put up these slides was that you know this is how end of would present, and microbiology plays a very important role in how we uh, go ahead with treatment. Um, So uh, the initial part is uh, making the diagnosis. As we all know, end of by definition is an inflammatory process which is secondary to an exogenous infection entering the eye, uh, most commonly in the post-operative period. So it commonly presents with circumcillary congestion. There will be some amount of media highs. Patient comes with pain, blurring of vision, hypopion, or AC reaction, and lid edema. And uh, it's by no uh, conjuncture that these were also the uh, mentioned uh, signs and symptoms in the EVS, the circumcillary congestion being the most common at 92%, followed by uh, media haze. And uh, pain, lid edema uh, were uh, seen in 30% and about 12% uh, respectively. So once we arrive at a diagnosis of uh, end of, uh, one, of the, one other thing that you should consider that, you know, whether this particular patient has an infective uh, etiology or is it a TARS or is it post-operative reaction? So the, the concept of post-operative reaction is if the pupil is stretching or there was a lot of uh, iris prolapse, then uh, directly you know that you have manipulated. So some amount of inflammation is something that you would expect. But however, in an uh, uneventful surgery, if this is the picture, then you should consider either end of or TARS. So how do we differentiate TARS is, you know, as the name indicates, it is an anterior uh, uh, segment uh, shock syndrome. So most of, uh, most commonly it is seen on post-op day one, however, end of is seen after four to five days. Congestion is usually not there. Congestion is the most commonly seen uh, sign in uh, end of. Pain is usually absent. End of is usually painful. Corneal edema is diffuse from uh, end to end white to corneal white to white. However, uh, patchy corneal edema is a characteristic feature that you see in end of thalmitis. So how to differentiate uh, with the uh, more certainty, whether it is TAS or end of, is that you do an ultrasound. When uh, there was an anterior segment reaction and you see this kind of picture on the ultrasound, it means that you are dealing with post-operative endophthalmitis. Now, what is next is after you have documented all these signs, 
uh, you know either through a, a clinical picture or a very good fund as drawing because it's you know these are the patients who will require follow ups and also prognosis is not going to be too good second thing is do a, a ultrasound examination serially which would uh, can be required so uh, the uh, the first one should be documented and uh, you know stored in the file second thing is you discuss the treatment option to the patient that you know initially we will try and manage with injection if required surgery may be required and at every step which will be guided by microbiology samples why i am stressing on microbiology samples is because it will deal with what kind of antibiotics we are going to give with so when the vision is counting fingers or better so my initial plan will be i will plan in intravitreal antibiotics usually antibacterial is the one that i would uh, th- you know consider however because we have an in house lab and we can process the sample within 5 to 10 minutes what i do is i give a block to the patient and i take a, a insulin syringe with 26 gauge needle with the piston out i do an ac tap and i send it to the lab so in the meanwhile the lab will tell me whether uh, you know by doing a gram stain and koh whether it is bacterial or not usually uh, you know within a few minutes we are notified uh, if they find that it was uh, uh, you know a gram positive or a gram negative cocci or uh, you know gram negative bacilli and considering that it is a, it is a bacterial this thing so i would probably inject ceftazidem 2.25 mg along with vancomycin uh, and dexa if the gram stain does not yield any any info i would still go ahead with uh, injection of ceftazidem and vancomycin i would omit dexa and the patient is reassessed within 48 hours if it is worsening then vitrectomy is something that i would consider however uh you know these are the reports that usually our lab sends us a message immediately when we send them if you see that there is gram positive cocci or polymorph you know it, it literally confirms that it is bacterial however gram stain also can detect you know fungal uh, uh, yeast like this thing and also hyphae like you see in the second picture however koh and calculophor will combined staining will uh, you know increase your detection rate of fungal hypha as you can see so what i would do if i don't get this before i inject i usually use a 24 gauge needle and take a vitreous sample and i send that for culture and also for pcr so uh, why did we choose ciftazidem and vancomycin is not just along with the evs trial but also uh, recent cultures of uh, you know quarterly when we do we keep a note of that and you can see that ciftazidem uh, shows about 70% uh, sensitivity for gram positive cocci and gram negative bacilli and along if you combine that with vancomycin Uh, which has a 50% coverage then you are almost including majority of the spectrum of the bacteria another important thing is if you consider piperacillin and tazobactam which can be injected at 2.5 2.25 mg per 0.1 ml it seems to have a very very broad coverage and this has been uh, worked upon uh, by uh, the lvpa group also however if the microbiology uh, you know reports says that you know we could see fungi or uh, you know hyphae on the koh and also on the grams then i would switch over and i would probably use voriconazole which is 100 micrograms per 0.1 ml which is injected and uh, before injection like i told you i would also use a 24 gauge needle and send it for culture for further confirmation of the microbiology if the microbiologist is very sure that you know uh, it is candida where you can see gram positive you know yeast which are uh, which usually turn gram positive uh, then i would probably switch and consider using amphotericin b at 5 microgram per 0.1 ml and i usually omit injecting ceftra dexa or vanco because i know that it is fungal end of however if both have been uh, you know negative on the anterior chamber examination then probably i will go ahead by only giving antibacterial in the first one if the patient's presenting visual acuity is hand movements close face or if the patient is only pl plus then i would usually consider doing a vitrectomy so how would i proceed is uh, i usually put an infusion port uh, you th- there is a 6 mm uh, uh, 23 gauge port which is available in the trocar cannula i use direct perpendicular entry at uh, 3 mm considering the patient is post operative maybe usually has a good uh, uh, sort of ecchic and you know you are in the pars plan as well uh i after putting this cannula i usually take a sample from the aqueous uh, i also cause you know uh, remove the membranes over the aval and i immediately send it for microbiology and i also use the other port before switching on the infusion i collect about 200 microliter of aqueous and send all three together for uh, microbiological examination by the time i do vitrectomy i usually uh, get uh, you know a report so usually i do a core vitrectomy vitreous i will debulk as much as possible i never attempt a uh pvd when i'm doing uh, vitrectomy in an end of once the retina is fairly visible and i have adequately debulked the vitreous i do a partial fluid air exchange and inject antibiotics however if the underlying retina appears a little necrotic or you see that the uh, there is uh, retinal edema then i usually uh, inject silicone oil uh, because i want to be a little more 
um, uh, save on the safer side because it will help me evaluate the retina in the post operative period then i switch over to the post operative antibiotic and steroids uh, which are initiated and i keep the patient on a close follow up now uh, endovitrectomy study is the most important study which in spite of two uh, two decades being two decade old is still the one which uh, you know guides us in treatment this was an investigator initiated trial which had uh, taken 420 patients across 25 centers in us and they had randomized into four groups so all patient although required uh, although received in intravitreal antibiotics there was one group where vitrectomy with systemic iv steroids and intravitreal antibiotics was given there was one group where vitrectomy with only intravitreal antibiotics was given there was a group where vitreous tap was done with antibiotics and the fourth group where vitreous tap was done with iv with intravitreal antibiotics and also iv antibiotics so the intravitreal antibiotics that they chose was amikacin at 0.4 mg and vancomycin at 1 mg which we also currently use what were the intravenous drugs that they used for 5 to 10 days in these four in the two groups that they were randomized was that they used iv antibiotic which was ciftazidime which was 2 g every 8 hourly and whenever the patient was uh, sensitive uh, they switched over to ciprofloxacin 75 mg which was given twice orally the second systemic drug which was used in the us trial was amikacin so you can see that amikacin was given at 7.5 mg per as an initial dose and they were monitored by serum levels because amikacin can be known to be a toxic drug so what did the evs tell was that with reference to media clarity a significant greater percentage of patients in the wit group actually had better media which was 86 versus 75% however if you look at long term follow up the difference was not very significant that you know even the vitrectomy patients had 90% clear media however the tap group uh, tap and inject group had 83 systemic antibiotics whether it was ciftazidime amikacin or uh, ciprofloxacin they did not have any bearing on the final outcome there was also more rapid clearing of the media in the wit group although it was not associated with concomitant rapid improvement in visual acuity which means that clearance of media does not mean the patient is also going to get excellent vision so uh, continue with you know the evs uh, recommendations are these that you know it strongly su supports the use of vitrectomy after cataract surgery only in the patients who has pl vision if the patient is having any kind of counting finger vision those should be considered to give intravitreal antibiotics the study also found no advantage in performing immediate vitrectomy i'll finish in 30 seconds uh, however vitrectomy was valuable in patients where uh, 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 severe vision loss was half you can see that in 15% in the tap group had uh, you know severe vision loss however only 8% in the wit group had uh, better vision so how does it translate is that whenever you get a one eyed patient probably it is better to do a vitrectomy at the initial this is a, a small video of uh, 30 seconds so whenever you get a patient in the post op repeated like you see that if this patient had undergone a k pro where you cannot monitor anterior segment signs and uh, you know usually k pro is done in one eyed patients so these are the patients who would who you would like to directly take up for vitrectomy so once you clear off the retroprosthetic membranes so you can see that there is a lot of vitreous exudation which is there so i usually do a vitrectomy where i only do a debulking i never use any pull technique so once you start debulking and the retina is relatively seen you can just trim the vitreous uh, and uh, you know even in small pupils also with the current visualizing system you can see uh, most of the peripheral vitreous so so once this is done you can either decide on doing a partial fge and putting an antibiotic if the retina is bad then one would probably want to inject silicone oil so that was my time thank you very much uh very good uh, wonderful presentation it was really enjoyable and learned a lot again and again um uh, uh, you see uh, there were many questions in my mind everything got cleared up so one last stupid question i have is is there uh, that means there's no role of systemic antibiotic or in a very virulent case would you think of giving an antibiotic which is same as what you gave intravitreally uh Ma'am, actually, uh, uh, if you look at many retinologists, you know my mentors also used to use systemic antibiotics. Many people thought that ciprofloxacin or you know usage of uh, Dr. T. P. Das has a publication where they say that usage of fluoroquinolones uh, has uh, you know uh, raised the intravitreal uh, concentration to MIC levels of more than fifty percent. But however, the EVS had given the same dosage. Ciprofloxacin was used at seven hundred and fifty milligram on a BT dosage. but they did not find any uh, improvement so if you are looking at evidence based uh, you know two decades ago they proved that they don't have any role i not think the important thing is that if you if you are giving intravitreal antibiotics then the intravenous antibiotic does not add to the to the uh, levels 
But if you're not giving intravitreal antibiotics, that's not so. That's number one. The second thing is that if you're putting silicone oil inside the eye, then the levels will change. Then this thing does not apply. EVS is only applicable to eyes which have had a conventional vitrectomy. In eyes which have had silicone oil with uh, injection with vitrectomy, we found that the, the levels double. They become almost parallel to the level, the systemic levels that you get. So in those cases, there is a huge difference. That paper is published in uh, IOVS. A quick question to Murli Dar, sir, and then we can go on to the next talk. Sir, in case of these endophthalmitis with silicon oil, which uh, Tirumalesh has nicely mentioned and uh, he has uh, elaborately told about the steps, what he does. In silicon oil, do you uh, decrease the dosage of these antibiotic injections or in which cases do you prefer using silicon oil and what's your dosage of antibiotics when you use silicon oil or endophthalmitis? I prefer to use silicon oil in severe end of, especially post-traumatic end of, uh, where there is a lot of... Uh, vitreous change and possible retinal detachment. In those situations, where the retina appears necrotic, as Thirumalesh said, I would prefer to use silicon oil. And uh, regard to the antibiotics, generally I use half dose of the dose that we normally use in a, a non-silicon filled eye. So that means if you are using one milligram vancomycin, I use half of that dose. You know, generally septazidine or vancomycin, I would use half dose in a silicon filled eye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thiru. Uh, wonderful presentation. We can go on to the next talk, madam. Uh, would we go back to Dipti or? Dipti, are you there? Yes. Yes, I'm there. Yes. Yeah. I'll try it this way without the video. If it works, well and good. Yeah. I'll begin where I stopped. Can you see the slides yes, now? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. So I had stopped at treat management of CMV retinitis. The dosages and details are... Uh, discussion I'll skip for now. I'll just uh, like to add here that there is a loading dose and there is a maintenance dose. So for both, for uh, oral, uh, I, I mean systemic uh, antivirals and intravitreal, once we uh, see a retinal detachment, a paspena vitrectomy becomes imperative. Uh, the intraocular therapy with the uh, intravitreal gancyclovir or bocarnet is followed initially thrice a weekly or bi-weekly. And uh, once the lesions start to respond, then we can sh uh, then it is shifted to weekly. Uh, it is uh, important to know a couple of side effects of each of the drugs that we are using. So when you are studying this, please make a point of those uh, points as well. A drug resistance here must be noted. Excellent. That is why uh, is it is it seen now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, drug, drug resistance is noted. That is why maintenance therapy and a combination of systemic and intravitreal uh, tends to be more effective. This is the next pechan con. I, I am going to be talking on PORM, but uh, like this slide shows, it can be quite confusing if uh, we don't know what we want to look for. Uh, so uh, PORM is another condition which is precipitated by herpes uh, viridae, and uh, this can be unilateral or bilateral right from the out, uh, outside itself. It is seen in immunocompromised individuals again. We can see here that uh, the vitritis or any sort of inflammation is conspicuous by its absence. The lesions start in the periphery or the macula. Initially, there may be single lesions which later coalesce to form uh, 360 degree uh, lesions. There can be a mortal pigmentation after healing. And uh, I would like to stress again here that there is no inflammation. So no vasculitis, no hemorrhages, and we can see that the veins are spared. Here we should know the other causes of uh, retinal whitening and other causes of what can cause a mortal pigmentation in the retina. Mm. This is again a clinical diagnosis. This progresses rapidly and causes blindness in weeks if not treated. Here too, intravenous and intravitreal therapy as a combination works well. And when retinal detachments are seen, vitrectomy is advised. This is the same again. I would just like to stress on the point of barrage laser here that when we see the lesions are he uh, healed, then uh, we'll do a barrage laser in the healthy retina just within the margin, just in order to prevent progression of the retinal detachment, if at all. But inevitably, if it progresses, then we have to do a vitrectomy. We will see uh, ARN next. So this, this is what uh, it can mimic ARN. ARN is again a caused by herpes viridae. Here, there is a full blown inflammation in the anterior segment, in the posterior segment. The vitritis can be so dense that the retina may not even be seen. The KPs are large, granular, and uh, sort of mutton fat KPs. 
the retinitis here is necrotizing there is obliteration of the smaller arterioles and capillaries by thrombi which cause uh, retinal necrosis immunocompetence here is the hallmark because the even if the patient is a known case of hiv or uh, other uh, conditions there is there is a good cd4 count and the immune system is functioning well but some studies have shown that this can be seen in other systemic disorders like diabetes or if the patient is on some long term medications or as a telltale sign of malignancy this criteria can be found in any standard textbook we'll skip skip this slide this again follows uh, varicella zoster or even sub herpes simplex uh, virus uh, like i said that there is dense vitreous lesions are peripheral and discontinuous and they coalesce quickly to form full thickness uh, necrotic areas uh, arteriolitis fibritis uh, and hemorrhages as well the mid periphery tends to get necrosed very often and there are multiple posterior breaks which cause retinal detachment and although the posterior pole might appear to be spared there is very poor uh, prognosis here because the optic nerve gets involved quickly and the rd is very indolent to treat pcr again of the aqueous or vitreous can be done here to confirm uh, what virus was there treatment of AR, ARN again is with iv cyclovis and in this case after 24 to 48 hours of starting the antiviral therapy systemically steroids are started to curb the active inflammation these steroids need to be tapered very slowly along with the maintenance dose of the uh, antiviral that we are using in this case one point to note is that aspirin is used to uh, treat the thrombotic occlusion or rather to prevent further Dr. thrombotic time is up. In, yes uh, in the retina prophylactic laser like i mentioned in the previous case one last slide of non necrotizing herpetic retinitis this is seen uh, in patients uh, who following the uh, varicella zoster infections initially it was seen mainly in children but now with the advent of hart it can be seen in adults as well whose immune status uh, is in uh, immune status here rather is in material even if the patient has a good immune system it can still uh, develop this uh, there is acute retinochoroiditis with diffuse hemorrhages but uh, the there is no necro necrotic retina here it presents uh, bilaterally most of the cases it is tend to be treated as a non infective case initially and uh, seeing there is no response uh, it sometimes foxes the uh, clinician but once oral antivirals are started this responds very well and then uh, then rather we can come down to the diagnosis of non necrotizing hepatic retinitis here thank you i'm sorry for the interruption no no that was a, a very good talk and i you tried your best to keep it as concise as possible uh, i think uh, we would go on to our next speaker i'm sorry we go on to our next speaker dr manoj who is a senior consultant with your retina and uva services neuro ophthalmology and electro diagnostics from a very well known chain of chaitanya group of eye hospitals based in trivandrum he is going to detail on wet amd on to you dr manoj could you Share your screen. Yeah, I'm just about. Can you see my slides now? Yes, sir. We are able to see your slides. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, AOS IRC, for this opportunity. Thank you, Srinivas. so what i'll be uh, trying to do is to try to actually um, uh, talk to you uh, talk to i mean from the from the pg point of view how to approach a case of wet amd i would i would focus on how how to make a diagnosis more than how to treat uh, just touch upon how to treat but then i would be pro uh, uh, focusing on how to approach a case of wet amd now uh, this is the uh, this is the definition age related maculopathy um, is defined as a degenerative disease um, in individuals over 50 years characterized by drusens of more than 63 microns with pigmentary changes uh, retinal pigment epithelial atrophic changes or exudative changes in the absence of other retinal disease the classification is this we are uh, more bothered about uh, wet amd here so this is uh, part of late arm and exudative uh, amd is otherwise called as wet amd and this is characterized by presence of coronal neovascularization pigment epithelial detachment and and discreform scar now under coronal neovascularization we have these three uh, important entities typical amd polypoidal coronal vasculopathy and retinal angiomatous polyfills now this is the drusens um, so patients with typical amds should have drusens they should have drusens in the same eye which has the cnv uh, has the exudative process or they should have at least these drusens in the other eye so you look for these drusens and if especially if you see these large kind of drusens 
which are more than 125 microns or drusens which are uh, in the size of more than 63 microns it is significant now uh, wet amd manifests um, uh, in the form of uh, peds peds you, you, you can see serious peds on clinical examination which are fluid filled um, uh, you know, rp elevations or you can have hemorrhagic peds you can also have drusenoid peds when the drusens become confluent and then you can also have the fibrovascular peds which are nothing but um, ha um, uh, harboring um, neovascular issues and um, the hallmark of uh, wet amd is the presence of coronal neovascularization uh, when, when you do a good 90 d examination or a 70 d examination you can you could make out these membranes uh, sometimes they are ill defined and sometimes you see them well defined when well defined they are usually classic cnvms when they are ill defined it is usually occult cnvms and these uh, membranes usually have exudation around it and uh, and also hemorrhages the hemorrhages are usually subretinal you can also have sub rpe hemorrhages you can buy, you can make this difference from from the color you can also have preretinal hemorrhages in some instances and um, uh, the other in, the, the entity that uh, that closely mimics the typical amd is polypoidal coronal, coronal vasculopathy how do you uh, diagnose this uh, when you do your clinical examination if you see orange red nodules that are seen in the macular region they are suggestive of polyps you see polyps or if, if you see these large drusenoid deposits which are also called as pachydrusens or if you see subretinal hemorrhages which are like in the in the range of around four disc uh, diameters these are these patients are most likely to have polyporal uh, coronal vasculopathy than typical amd and many of these patients have both mixture of both exudative as well as hemorrhagic forms again when you see a patient uh, where you have a lot of peri papillary lesions lesions around the um, around the disc or if you see peripheral lesions then this is likely to be um, pcv uh, amd patients have lesions um, or, uh, in the macular region only and uh, as i said before they are uh, you may, you see drusens that are associated with these lesions in the same eye or in the other eye and again scarring is a is a, is a process that is commonly seen in amd patients and and not um, not seen uh, very often in pcv patients again if uh, the age of the patient also could give you a clue um, pcv patients tend to be a little younger than um, amd patients retinal angiomatous proliferance is another type of um, wet amd process where uh, these patients have intraretinal hemorrhages not subretinal they have intraretinal hemorrhages um, usually along with pigment epithelial detachments and also you can make out the presence of a retinal retinal anastomosis or a retinal coronal anastomosis uh, that can be seen in, uh, during a clinical examination so when you see an obvious cnbm you think of these three entities uh, you try to fit them into either typical amd or pcv or rap first based on the clinical examination if you could if you cannot put them in these three categories you are probably dealing with a secondary cnvm uh, these are the entities which are commonly associated with secondary cnvms fa remains an essential investigation so if an examiner asks you what is the the first investigation that you would do it is better um, because many of the examiners you know the old examiners would like to hear fa first so it remains the essential investigation to diagnose and assess disease activity and this has already been elaborated before um, you have to tell the examiner that you will be looking at the early phase of the fa and the late phase of the fa uh, if you see a membrane that is appearing well defined membrane that is appearing in the early phase of um, fa and then the, this membrane becoming very leaky the late phase of fa you are dealing with a classic cnvm uh, if you see an ill defined uh, membrane in the early phase of the fa uh, with some leakage in the late phase of angiogram you are probably dealing with occult coronal neovascularization now the next question ka, that examiners can ask you is what are the indications for icg angiography so when are you suspecting pcv so on the based on the clinical suspicion if you are suspecting pcv this this then this is an indication for icg angiography because icg angiography is the diagnostic investigation uh, for pcv again in patients where you suspect rap based on clinical examination icg has a major role to play in occult coronal neovascularization also icg has a role to play especially when you are dealing with a poorly responding uh, coronal neovascularization you should be aware of this um, classification of occult CN, uh, cnvm based on icg this is classified into plaques hot spots and combination lesions when you have a combination of plaques and hot spots now if you get an icg picture uh, how do you identify an icg picture is look at the disc you see this um, the the blackness of the of the disc tells you that you are dealing with an icg picture so what should you look at when you see an icg picture first look for these hot spots 
you see these hot spots here if you see multiple hot spots you are probably dealing with um, with polypoidal coronal vasculopathy if you're seeing um, an, a single or a focal hot spot, you're probably dealing with a typical AMD or even a retinal um, angiometrous proliferance. Um, in 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 uh, RAP patients, you can see that uh, you can you can see that the uh, angiogram demonstrate the presence of retina retinal anastomosis or the retinal coronal anastomosis as well. Um, patients uh, with occult CNVMs, um, uh, if you if you take an ICG, often you see this plug appearance. So plug is an important feature uh, that you see on 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 uh, ICG angiography. ICG angiography in the early phase, you can also pick out these membranes. So look for membranes, look for hot spots, look for plaques, look for membranes on the on the ICG uh, pictures. Um, when you see membranes associated with hot spots, then you you should understand that this is probably a patient with PCV. The PCV patients, this is a branching vascular network with a with a uh, polyp that you see. Um, the OCT is currently the most popular. In so industry. one minute left. Sorry. A minute left, sir. Yeah. Um, so OCT helps us to differentiate uh, between uh, um, classic and occult CNV. When you see this hyperreflective uh, reflectivity uh, lying above the retinal pigment epithelium, then this is a classic CNVM or a type two CNVM. When you see when you see it lying under the retinal pigment epithelium, when the retinal pigment epithelium is elevated you are probably dealing with an occult coronal neovascularization or a type 1 CNVM. And um, so these are types of PED. So when you see PEDs like this, when you see this configuration, a thumb-shaped PED or a massively diffusely enlarged um, PED, or when you see multiple notched PEDs or a tent-like PED with uh, no internal reflectivity, so these are uh, OCT findings uh, that's, that are suggestive of PCV. Um, in patients with uh, retinal um, angiometric proliferance or type 3 CNVMs, the, the characteristic uh, OCT finding is a serious PD with a reflectivity uh, about, uh, and often you see a lot of interretinal fluid. This is a characteristic OCT picture that, that, that can be kept, uh, which is suggestive of type 3 coronal neovascularization. Again, looking at the choroid may help you to understand. If you see a thick choroid like this, which is referred to as pachychoroid, then you're probably dealing with the polypoidal coronal vasculopathy. But like you see in this picture here, the choroid is thinner. With, a, with an overlying uh, pigment epithelial detachment, this is suggestive of typical AMD. So looking at the choroid will also help you to differentiate between typical AMD and PCV. The third thing that you need to look at in OCT is to define whether the disease is active or not. When you see fluid on the, in the OCT, intraretinal fluid or subretinal fluid, then you know that this is an active CNVM process. If you don't see fluid, it is probably an, an inactive process. Um, again, um, multimodal imaging uh, uh, is a useful tool sometimes in differentiating these patients. Like in this patient here, you see a lot of angiographic leakage and you also see something like a fluid here. But this patient on autofluorescence showed the increased autofluorescence here. This is a, a adult vitally formed dystrophy which looked like CNVM. So mimics of CNVMs um, may need multimodal imaging to clarify. O OCT angiography pictures also can be kept now for examination. So this is um, uh, these are pictures of OCT angiography where you see this um, neovascular network. Um, there are some classifications uh, based on, uh, on OCT angiography, and this helps us to understand whether it is an active disease process or, a, uh, or an inactive process. Active disease process have a lot of anastomotic channels along with main trunks, whereas um, the inactive disease, um, they do not have a lot of anastomosis. That helps us to differentiate whether it is an active CNVM process or not. Octa is also useful in patients with the RAP because um, it helps us to identify that the, um, the new aspiration arises from the retina and not from the choroid. Um, and uh, finally, um, so uh, uh, this is how we would approach a case of wet AMD. The first step one is to identify what is the type of wet AMD based on clinical angiographic and OCT characteristics. And sometimes you need to resort to multimodal imaging to, um, in, in doubtful cases. Step two is to identify if, uh, whether it's an active or inactive disease and, and thereafter you know, the treatment uh, plan is adopted. You always look at other eye because the presence of drusens and other findings on the other eye will help you make a diagnosis. Just to touch upon uh, treatment, anti of therapy is a mainstay of treatment. So if they ask you oh, how would you treat this patient, be it PCV or be it um, um, uh, AMD, you can, tell, you can say that it's anti of therapy is the main mode of therapy. Uh, you would, uh, they would like to know what are the names of the drugs that are that are used that is already covered. What are the strategies that are that are currently available? Now you, you, you can talk about monthly injection or a PRN injection or what is called as a treat and extend injection. You should at least know what what these means. In PRN injection, 
patients are examined periodically and injections are given depending on the disease activity if there is disease activity give an injection if there is not if there no disease activity don't give an injection in treated extent what you do is you give, you give an injection and you extend the injections at two weekly intervals to a maximum of 12 to 16 weeks so at least you should know these terms and uh, patients with polypodal if you are if you think you are dealing with a polypodal coronal vasculopathy case you can either um, say that you would uh, you would be using monotherapy that is only antiviral patients or you would combine antiviral patients with uh, with photodynamic therapy thank you thank you very much uh, dr for a very detailed talk uh, paucity of time we are not going to take discussions we go on to our next speaker dr manish uh babai who is going to be dealing on posterior segment trauma dr manish could you share your screen is a very versatile amazing surgeon managing vitreo retina uvea neuroophthalmic trauma cataract and lasik clearly shows is an individual of tremendous skill sets so let's hear from him i think after these three talks we can have the discussion madam yes sure um uh, yeah uh good evening everybody thank you for uh, opportunity uh, madam uh i'll be talking about assessment of the posterior segment trauma uh let's try to go to full screen uh excuse me sir so put it in presentation mode sir yeah i'm on the bottom right i uh, it's i think this thing is not going down so i'm not able to just press f5 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 yeah i'll just stop and share again if you can yeah i'll i'll stop and share again just give me have you yeah just just give me a minute yeah yeah sure is it visible now uh yes uh good evening everybody i, I will be talking about assessment of posterior segment trauma at the outset i would like to thank arc uh, thank dr uh, chitra madam and uh, shrinivas for giving me this opportunity so assess uh, when a patient with uh, trauma comes to uh, comes to your clinic uh, there are certain things that we should be knowing there are certain things that uh, as post graduates we should be knowing the one is ocular trauma classification uh, terminology uh, as to what what is an eye wall which is sclera and cornea closed globe injury where their uh, eye wall is not breached open globe injury where it is breached whether it is rupture which happens because of blunt trauma severe blunt trauma laceration which is usually because of sharp object which is a full thickness eye wall injury penetrating injury where there is a single laceration while the perforating injury where there are there is a entrance and exit wound and intraocular foreign body when there is a retained foreign object inside the eye uh the most the, the more common trauma among the trauma is blunt ocular trauma and uh, easy way to remember uh, the seven rings of blunt ocular trauma which will give us a clue when we are uh, treating uh, when we are assessing these patients there is pupillary sphincter tear iridodialysis angle recession cyclodialysis cleft trabecular meshwork tear lens zollner dialysis and retinal dialysis so uh, when we are seeing these patients uh, when we are evaluating these patients we have to take the history a detailed history whether it's a penetrating or blunt trauma we have to make sure that medical legal consent forms are filled whatever are relevant to your institute uh the visual acuity has to be checked that has to be the first thing to be checked uh and documented before you do anything even if the patient is uh, bedridden it has to be checked uh, by sight slit lamp examination for any anterior segment uh anterior segment uh, damage which is there pupillary examination for uh, rapd to see whether there is any optic nerve injury Applanation tension is obviously avoided in closed globe while in uh, in open globe while in closed globe it can be it should be checked. 
fundus examination depends on media clarity uh, and i will come to that little later and uh, the investigation x rays are not very commonly used the ct scan is a preferred technique and uh, we'll come to again in detail about it uh, ultrasound e scan has been uh, dealt in detail uh, in earlier uh, topics um, so basically i would like to show you about the core surgical correlation of the assessment and investigation so as to it will help us in uh, you know understanding what what to look for when we are uh, seeing these patients so Coming to fundus examination, the, if the media is clear, we have to look at, we can see the common presentations that is Berlin cedema, choroidal tear, there might be a secondary CNBM if it's a long-standing trauma, there might be a traumatic macular hole or retinal dialysis with or without retinal uh, detachment and optic nerve, uh, optic disc avulsion rarely. In cases of penetrating ocular trauma, rarely we might be able to see fundus if there is, uh, intra, there is an intraocular foreign body which has spared the lens. Um, so Berlin edema, it as uh, this is not an edema. This is um, transient whitening of the retina because of following blunt trauma. It is usually associated with outer segment, uh, out, uh, outer segment injury or uh, of the photoreceptors, as we can see here in the OCT associated. Choroidal tear again. Uh, it, if it is running through the uh, fovea, as in the, as in this patient, uh, we can see that there might be a significant vision loss. Where in the OCT, we can see the uh, choroidal tear along with the uh, subretinal hemorrhage in the subfoveal space here. Uh, this is a old. Uh, this this is a patient with uh, old trauma about six months back who presented with vision loss. Where we can see. Type 2 uh, membrane treated with antivitef. A traumatic macular hole uh, might be seen here. We did, once it is treated with inverted flap technique, the macular hole is closed. Um, OCT is an effective method of uh, assessing these patients. This is another patient of traumatic macular hole where we can see the whole edges are lifted preoperatively and there are cystic, cystoid changes. There is no PVD as can be seen in this uh, OCT and uh, intraoperatively, what does it mean? This is a younger patient. The patient doesn't have a PVD, so PVD has to be induced. This is aspiration scraper, uh, which is used for induction of PVD. Uh, the PVD can be induced and then uh, vitrectomy is completed. And then uh, here the Internal limiting membrane peeling is done with inverted flap technique where the inner ring of the ILM peeling is bunched onto the uh, foveal area and then the peripheral ILM is peeled. Uh, this was a large foreign body. This is one of the rare things where we don't, uh, we can see a large foreign body on x ray where, um, and we can see uh, this huge foreign body which was lying on the retinal surface, uh, which had spared the lens. And intraoperatively, here we can see the foreign body is uh, about 11 millimeters long, straight metallic rod, which is lying on the retinal surface. The vitrectomy is completed, one of the scleroderma is enlarged, an intraocular magnet by Dr is used to railroad this large foreign body out of the eye. So assessing the foreign body, uh, assessing this case, we have, we have to plan our surgery as well. Here, as the foreign body is removed, the lens uh, remains undamaged and patient has got good visual outcome. Uh, when there is the media are hazy and there is absence of fundus view, we need radiological investigation and CT scan is a preferred technique. We have to order axial and coronal scans with one to two millimeter sections or B or and both investigations might be required in these patients. B scan ultrasound with vector A scan and B scans are avoided in open globe injury. It is first better to close the globe and then in second stage do ultrasound. 10 or 20 megahertz probe might be used as discussed by previous speakers. And uh, yeah, at looking at the extraocular, uh, th this is a large foreign body which is extraocular and intraconal and uh, 
when we are doing surgery this is what we should expect this this is where the uh, sclera is being closed and then the uh, medial rectus muscle is tagged and it is disinserted and the foreign body uh, can be seen lying exactly where it was seen in the um, ct scan so assessing the ct scan pre operatively helps us in knowing where what we are dealing with and what we are we have to expect intraoperatively here is a large foreign body this is a next patient who is having a large foreign body with collapsed eyeball and this is a large non metallic foreign body in the eye this was removed using the claw forceps that i happened to design and this is intraoperatively after the sclera is closed and well lensectomy is done this is a large foreign body in the vitreous cavity the time is up so the vitrectomy i'll just finish this video so the vitrectomy is completed around the eye the sclerotomy is enlarged and claw is used to pick up the foreign body and then it is taken out of the eye through limb a large limb sec section we can see this is a large foreign body here i'll just uh, this was a patient with dislocated lens and perforating trauma here we can see this lens and uh, there is a lens which was seen in the previous ultrasound and there is area of incarceration in the vitreous which can be seen i'll skip through this video and uh, just to uh, just to conclude we, there is something called the ocular trauma score which was proposed by kun which gives uh, the draw points to, uh, depending on presentation and final calculation it helps in prognosticating the case so uh, to conclude i think we have to do a detailed and meticulous examination of a severe uh, ocular trauma and it is used uh, important in uh, the aim of evaluation is to treatment planning surgical planning and correlation prognosis and counseling the patient thank you all for um, patient listening thank you very much dr manish that was a brilliant presentation uh, we would come back to you with questions after we uh, hear the other two speakers our next you, speaker is dr deyansh mishra who is a consultant vitreo retina and ocular oncology of shankara group of eye hospitals bangalore and a very capable surgeon of repute he is going to take us on an interesting topic retinoblastoma uh thank you man uh, can i have the screen share uh, tech team can i have the screen share you so you will have to do the screen share sir to do the screen share okay i've got it okay the bottom green yeah yeah okay so is my screen visible hopefully yes. i'm audible too yes so thank you aios thank you arc uh, uh, thank you dr shrinivas and uh, dr uh, chitra madam for giving us the opportunity to present so my topic for today is how to approach a case of retinoblastoma so i would be covering the topic in this sub topics the first and foremost is the history so if you get a case of retinoblastoma we should ask regarding the antenatal history whether the mother had any illness any drug intake or vaccination which she has taken before birth history like whether the child is mature or premature type of delivery postnatal history like at the time of presentation what was the age and history of trauma squint or any other illness which the child is having most importantly we should ask for is the family history because if the parents are having retinoblastoma the risk of having the, uh, the retinoblastoma in the child is also high what complaints the child can present with the most common complaints are leukocoria strabismus as you can see in this child the other on common ones are hyphema vitreous hemorrhage ocular inflammation this can also uh, mimic you know, ocular inflammation or retinoblastoma hypopion which can be either mobile or non mobile which would be seeding into the anterior chamber the non mobile ones it can also present as pseudo orbital cellulitis in certain cases and yes very rare presentation we can see this fungating mass coming out of the eye or the whole eye getting proptosed this is called as extraocular retinoblastoma so when we are examining the child what all should be looked at so as we can see the child has to be comfortably seated either in parents lap or either the child should be made to lie down we should try to identify the origin of leukocoria like cornea lens or other things anterior chamber if we are evaluating we need to try to identify if it's having hypopion nodules that may be either retinoblastoma nodules 
neovascularization or if the lens is having cataract or what kind of reflex it is. Is it a white reflex or a yellow or orange reflex, which is called a xanthochoria? And most importantly, when we are doing an indirect ophthalmoscopy, yes, the child are uncooperative, but at least we should try to identify the posterior pole, the disc and macula, if there are tumors over there. If the child is old enough, we can try to indent because the retinoblastoma can present as peripheral tumors, as you can see over here. Investigations which should be done in retinoblastoma, yes, the most common investigation which most of us ophthalmologists would have is a B-scan where we need to look at uh, calcification or a tumor mass arising from the retina. The other investigation which is of choice is an MRI. If it's a unilateral retinoblastoma, what all needs to be seen in MRI? We need to personally review the films to look for optic nerve involvement or extraocular <clears throat> involvement and yes, the confirmation of diagnosis. If the child is having a bilateral retinoblastoma, except what we have discussed earlier, most important is to rule out the trilateral retinoblastoma in a bilateral case. CT scan is not a choice of investigation in retinoblastoma because we have to avoid the high radiation because of the CT scan. That can be a risk of having <coughs> secondary malignancy. <coughs> what are the differential diagnoses? The most common differential diagnosis of retinoblastoma is the Coats disease. Retinoblastoma presents in uh, early decades, like less than five years. It is mostly bilateral. Coats is usually present in the first decade two to 10 years of age, it is usually unilateral and vitreous seeds are common in retinoblastoma. The reflex or the cat's eye reflex, uh, as we can see in the lower image, it's white in cases of retinoblastoma and it's yellow to orange in cases of Coats disease. And vascular formations, malformations are more important even if the retina is completely detached, as you can see, those vascular malformations can very well not be missed. Other important things are the calcium, as we can see either a CT scan or an MRI or a B scan would show more calcification except in cases of quotes, it would not show calcification, it would show cholesterol. And most importantly, when we are doing a clinical examination, we can see that in retinoblastoma, there would be a blood vessel which would be entering into the tumor cavity as compared to a quotes which we would see subretinal yellow exudates, which are cholesterol, and the blood vessels would be going above it. Other important differential diagnoses are ROP or retroventral fibroplasia, where the history of prematurity would be there, and ICU stay, oxygen, Total RD would be there, but there would be no calcification. It can have a developmental or a congenital cataract where the eye would be quiet. No mass lesion or no calcification would be found out. Some retinal complications like FEVR or a familial exudative vitro retinopathy, which can have subretinal heart exudates, fibrous proliferations all over. It's mostly bilateral and have very high uh, predilection for uh, uh, siblings which would be affected, which can be screened or either an FFA would be done to identify uh, early cases. PHPV is the again, again a next uh, differential diagnosis where we can see a sectoral cataract and a stalk extending from the disc to the lens. Endogenous endophthalmitis, which can be a mimicker where there would be circumciliary congestion, no calcification which would be seen and yes, complicated cataract can be there. So the non-dubious ones like choroidal col uh, col choroidal coloboma, which can be there, which can have iris colobomas also, usually involving the inferior nasal side. And yes, toxocariasis, where history of pet exposure would be there and there would be a peripheral glanoma what we can see over here and a peripheral glanoma causing a tractional retinal detachment which can be made out. In cases where we think of patient is having a retinoblastoma, we need to do an examination under anesthesia. As we can see, when we are evaluating a child, we need to examine the anterior chamber, posterior chamber and the lymph nodes, face and other areas to look whether the patient is having complications associated with the retinoblastoma. And retinoblastoma, if it is associated with seeds, vitreous seeds, subretinal seeds, like that. The classification which is most commonly followed right now is the ICRB classification, where group A means a less than 3 mm size of a retinoblastoma, as in this case, we can see it can involve posteriorly or peripherally. B, which is a bubble retinoblastoma, more than 3 mm of size with minimal SRF around it. C, which can have circumscribed uh, or uh, uh, subretinal or preretinal or vitreous seeds which are along the tumor mass or D which can have diffuse seeding as we can see over here in this case where a retinoblastoma is there and the tumor is having multiple preretinal and subretinal seedings in different areas other than the tumor mass lesion. E which is massive retinoblastoma necessitating enucleation like tumor involving more than 50% of the globe or new vascularization, new vascularization of the anterior chamber, vitreous hemorrhage or the tumor itself presenting into the anterior chamber. Very rarely we can have diffuse infiltrating retinoblastoma where there would be a very small mass in the past plana or past plicata which uh, presents again and again as recurrent anterior uveitis or a mass in the anterior chamber. 
Yes, the next thing is what can be done if you identify that as a retinoblastoma. So early retinoblastoma can be lasered. You can use your green laser, which is available, or other. The most common used laser is the red laser, which is for a long, short wavelength, long duration wave uh, laser, which is called as a transpupillary thermotherapy, where it uh, gives more heat as compared to the coagulation, and that is how the tumor is treated. If the tumor is far peripheral and small, a triple free straw cryo can be done for it. If the tumor is having vitreous seeding, either a vitreous dust or cloud, we can give intravitreal chemotherapy agents like topotecan or melphalan. And there can be other types of seeds like spears, which we can see. Larger retinoblastomas can be treated with systemic chemotherapies. And yes, the, the, uh, the most recent, most uh, in vogue kind of a treatment is IAC or intra-arterial chemotherapy, where the chemotherapeutic agents are injected very close to uh, the ophthalmic artery. The local radiation, if we have the availability of either a ruthenium plaque or an iodine plaque, a plaque brachytherapy can be done or an external beam radiation can be done. But yes, last but not the least, if it doesn't respond, enucleation can be done for such cases. Most importantly, if the child is having a bilateral retinoblastoma, we should make the parents sit together, discuss, counsel regarding sibling screening and their future conception if they are planning. Try to do a genetic analysis for the child, try to identify the gene mutation. And if they are planning for a second baby, try to explain them regarding the risk and do a chorionic villus biopsy. Yes, whether metastatic evaluation needs to be done. So we need to look at risk factors. If it is intraocular, you need not. If it's extraocular, like optic nerve invasion, extrascleral or intracranial involvement, metastatic workup like bone marrow biopsy or bone scan or CSF tap needs to be done. Children with retinoblastoma do have very good vision. As in this case, we can see the child can have 6'6 six, six vision or yes, 6'9 six, depending upon where the tumor is. If the tumor is involving the macula also, the child can have mobile vision. Even larger tumors, the vision can be good enough for the child to be mobile. In group D, I can be salvaged. And yes, as we can see over here, the vision can be good enough for the patient to move around. Ocular aesthetics, yes, very important. Once you have enucleated, as the child grows, the processes need to be changed. Cosmetically, it is very important because it so affects fine. the patient's psyche. Yes, last two slides, please. Yeah. Re-examination. When should we re-examine the child? Yes, if the child is having retinoblastoma, it has to be followed for the rife because of risk of secondary tumors. Sporadic tumors, at least five years of follow-up are required where post-disease regression, three months for the first year, then six monthly for two years, and then beyond that yearly for three years. So what all we have discussed, how would we approach a case of retinoblastoma? History, family history, red flags, very important. Examination, slit lamp, IDO, investigations like USG, MRI, rule out other mimickers of RB. If you have identified an RB, classified in ICRB, and depending upon whether it is a local tumor, treat with different modalities which are available, local, focal, systemic, EBRT, BRACI, enucleation, sibling screening, genetic screening, metastatic workup if it is required, and salvage the vision. Yes, the children do see. Cosmetic rehabilitation is very important and follow-up. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for a very thorough information in your eight-minute talk. It's amazing. And, uh, and, and the mnemonics and the, this thing he has used, I think, which will help the postgraduates to remember it very well. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful uh, job, Devansh. Wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Last speaker in this uh, session and webinar is Dr. Namit D'Souza, who is going to be delving in central serous retinopathy. He's a consultant with your retina and diabetic retinopathy specialist from Manglu Retina Care. On to you, doctor. Thank you, madam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Srinivas, for giving me this opportunity. So last but not the least, I'll be presenting uh, about uh, central serous chorioretinopathy, which is one of the commonest uh, uh, disease which we see as uh, ophthalmologists. So it is characterized by serous retinal detachment, most commonly involving the macular area. Uh, it is uh, commonly seen in uh, youngsters between the age of 30 to 50, uh, 50 years. It has a male preponderance and uh, it is seen bilaterally in about 14 to 30% of these cases. So it uh, comes under the uh, family of pachychoroid disease spectrum uh, and they uh, share common typical features such as increased uh, choroidal thickness, dilated outer choroidal vessels, attenuation and uh, thinning of choroidal capillaries and uh, middle choroidal vessels. So coming to the risk factors, there are a lot of risk factors which are uh, implicated in the development of cent uh, central serous chorioretinopathy. Uh, basically, the main important risk factors are endogenous and exogenous steroids, which can be intravenous, uh, oral, intra-arterial, uh, uh, or any form of steroid, any amount of duration is implicated. Type A uh, behavior, uh, aggressive personality, people with the gastroesophageal reflex disorders, 
pregnancy sleep disturbance are implicated in the position of uh, csr all these have an increased uh, all these risk factors uh, increase the sympathetic activity they release the you know, catecholamines and uh, corticosteroids which have receptors on the uh, uh, choroidal vasculature and uh, this increases uh, stimulation of this increases the choroidal vascular permeability now if, if you see this uh, right side uh, lower uh, picture this is a scan of a classical csr you can see that the uh, vascular choroidal vasculature is almost uh, normal in uh, uh, consistency whereas if you see the upper picture the choroidal vessels are uh, dilated these dilated choroidal vessels they press upon the uh, adjoining choriocapillary layer and they cause ischemia uh, damage uh, to them they increase the hydrostatic pressure thus uh, causing aggression of uh, fluid and thereby resulting in central serous retinopathy now based on the duration and uh, rp changes uh, uh, csr is basically classified as acute uh, and chronic chronic we see a lot of uh, rp degeneration uh, tracks shallow srf and sciatic spaces so clinical course is usually these uh, acute csrs are self resolving in 90% uh, of the cases however 2 to 9 9% uh, they end up being chronic and uh, recurrence is usually seen in about 30 to 50% after one year so symptoms as you all know they come with the patient comes with blurred vision central scotoma metamorphopsia and when we do a refraction there is a hypermetropic shift uh, now diagnosis is uh, very straightforward it is clinical but always remember to do a oct also when he comes uh, during the first visit because subtle changes can be seen uh, by oct and you can quantify this uh, subretinal fluid while doing the oct and it will help in the follow up whether it is decreasing or it is increasing or remaining the same now oh, ffa is not done at the first visit unless uh, you are contemplating of uh, contemplating treatment uh, either by laser now coming to uh, the fundus picture uh, how does it appear uh, by on a slit lamp 90d slit lamp uh, biomicroscopy there is an absence of uh, foveal reflex uh, there is a round oval well uh, circumscribed area of srf that is seen uh in the center of the uh, macula the blood vessels are usually elevated at the uh, margins so as the uh, csr advances this is an acute csr which is seen after a month there there are uh, there will be some yellowish deposit which are typically uh, fibr fibrin proteins this these cases are likely to convert into chronic csr now the chronic csr have a lot of uh, rp disturbance in them you can see that the srf is uh, Uh, extending beyond the inferior arcade and there is a lot of rp disturbance you can see in the lower uh, picture there are a lot of rp tracks also that are seen coming to other forms like bulla of uh, bulla csr uh, it is an atypical form it uh, as the uh, name indicates it is associated with exudative detachment and it's common commonly seen in people uh, who are on uh, oral steroids also you can typically see subretinal fibrin you can see it under the superior temporal uh, vascular arcade and on while doing an ffa you will get multiple leaks so uh, uh, what do we see uh, what do we get to see uh, while doing a ffa what information you uh, get is that of a leak we can uh, we can know the area of leak in order to do the laser and uh, we can also know about the chronicity of the csr and also the rp uh, rp changes that are uh, associated with it also secondary cnvm which we have missed during our clinical examination can be uh, so what do we see in a, a ffa in a typical csr this is a FF, uh, on top of the uh, 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 my slide is a ffa of a typical csr which is uh, typically uh, pinpoint fluorescence which increase in size and uh, intensity it is called as the ink blot uh, uh, appearance it is seen 90% of the in 90% of the cases lower down you can see the smoke stack appearance which all with the pinpoint appearance it uh, um, becomes vertically uh, displaced and then it goes horizontal just like a mushroom sh uh, shape and it is called a smoke stack so smoke stack is seen 10% of the subjects and uh, you can see associated dot hyperfluorescent with window defects uh, telling us that the csr is in chronic uh, nature so ffa in chronic uh, csr 
we can see a lot of uh, early uh, window defects uh, that show us uh, in this uh, FFA, we can see a lot of window defects suggesting that there is a lot of RP damage. Now, it is always a good idea whenever uh, you have an auto floor sensor to do it because it tells us the vitality and the health of the RP. You know that uh, lipofusion, uh, RP contains lipofusion and that is, uh, uh, that's why the RP is damaged here and that's why it shows a hypo-autofluorescence. You can see the hyper-autofluorescence at the margin of the uh, uh, CSR, which says that there is overactivity of the surrounding RP cells. Now coming to the OCT findings, which already has been discussed, uh, you can see that this is a, a OCT of a classical CSR, wherein there is an elevation of the ellipsoid zone. And uh, in, uh, what is pushing it is a subretinal flu uh, fluid, which is hypo uh, reflective. And uh, you can see lower down, there is a serous PD, which you see in 70% of the cases of CSR, which is also hypo reflective. Now coming to chronic uh, OCD in chronic CSR, you can see that there is a uh, this is a uh, OCD of a chronic CSR where there are hyper reflective dots uh, suggesting uh, uh, the photoreceptor damage, and uh, with time it becomes complicated. And uh, on clinical examination, these are seen as yellowish dots. So what are the red flag signs in uh, uh, CSR? So hemorrhage is one uh, red flag sign. Always, never uh, an uh, oh, CSR is associated with hemorrhage. Whenever there is an hemorrhage, always do an FFA or uh, ICG and rule out CNVM because the treatment is completely different. Fibrin CSR, sometimes fibrin CSR can mimic CNVM because of the sheer uh, creamish color that uh, it has. So uh, we had a doubt and we had to clear by doing a fundus fluorescent angiography which showed us this pinpoint uh, looking hyperfluorescence which suggested it, it to be a CSR. So in this, uh, typical uh, patient, we did also a uh, OCT, which showed the vacuole sign, which is which has the central hypo hyperreflective area surrounded by a hyperreflective area because of the fibrin be being displaced by this uh, egress of the SRF. So also you can see there is a uh, break so in the up. RP also. You can also have double layered sign, which. Uh, uh, which shows hyperreflective, uh, which can be hyperreflective or hyperreflective. Hyperreflective double layer sign is typically seen in CSR. We are not uh, worried about it, but when it is uh, hyperreflective, we can uh, we can say that it is associated with CNVM. Now, differential diagnosis. There are a lot of uh, conditions which mimic uh, these uh, CSR. It can be optic disc. Uh, that's why it's a good idea to look at the optic nerve to know whether there's an optic disc pit also. AMD and PC, which I've already discussed, can be differentiated by doing a FFA or an ICG. Inflammatory conditions such as BKH can be differentiated. Sometimes they have, BKH have posterior pockets of uh, focal uh, SRF. They can mimic uh, CSR. It can be uh, differentiated by doing a, a FFA. Uh, the, in posterior celeritis, they can be posterior pockets, uh, which can be differentiated by doing a ultrasound. And also certain times there are intraocular tumors, which uh, were in an ultrasound like, uh, for example, a choroidal mass, which pushes and causes serious detachment, which can be differentiated by doing the ultrasound. So treatment is uh, very uh, straightforward. Acute CSR is a self-limiting condition. We can always uh, wait, manage conservatively. First episode, manage conservatively. Uh, take a good history of uh, medications that uh, lifestyle changes. Uh, counseling and also OCT has to be done every month. Now, this is a flow chart on, of how we uh, manage uh, acute CSR. We acute CSR always treat conservatively, do an OCT, repeat OCT every month. If it's improving, uh, follow him up until the uh, uh, follow him up every month until the SRF uh, resolves completely. If there is no improvement of if you are seeing an uh, increase in the SRF, then we should proceed with an FFA. Now, FFA can show us a uh, leak where the leak uh, site of the leak is if the extra leak is extra foveal we are very happy we can do a mild laser here by doing uh, using a thermal or a green laser and uh, the srf just disappears uh, in a few days time whether whereas when it's sub foveal uh, we are in trouble uh, because uh, doing a laser with a green laser can cause uh, scars and decrease in vision so the only choice is pdt Phototyramid therapy or micropulse laser or epineurone uh, uh, medication. So intravitreal uh, antivirus is only resolved in case of secondary C uh, only uh, reserved in case of uh, secondary CNVMs. So there are a lot of uh, uh, medical uh, uh, 
medicines that are available and tried out but what of what is of uh, most uh, uh, importance is the epineurone uh, which is a selective mineralo corticoid uh, corticoid receptor antagonist which acts on the receptors on the choroidal vasculature it decreases the uh, vascular permeability and thereby resolving the uh, csr so the common side effects are hyperkalemia that's why we have to do a, a, a 15 day checkup of his uh, blood electrolytes finally uh, csr is a complex disease a multi modal approach and a holistic approach is uh, is uh, required for its adequate treatment and to get back the patient's vision lost vision thank you very much thank you thank you so srinivas yeah thank you dr namit a wonderful presentation can you just uh, stop the screen share very so extensive we'll talk a panel discussion uh, we'll start with uh, dr ns murlidhar sir you have uh, points to add i'm sure uh, there are four talks and you must be having a, a few more points and suggestions from you we would like to listen from you sir no i think all the speakers have taken a lot of effort to put together all the points very well um uh, you know i have uh, very little to add in point in fact uh, i think dr deepthi kulkarni made very good points in terms of diagnosis of arn and how urgent it is to treat them because it's a rapidly progressive disease you know all types of viral retinitis whether it is cmv retinitis or whether it's a porn or arn uh, urgent diagnosis is very important and she stressed that it's a clinical diagnosis and it has to be substantiated by you know taking the fluid from the ac or vitreous and getting the P pcr you know diagnosed and a timely treatment and uh, dr uh, divyansh man uh, outlined the management of retinoblastoma very well i have nothing much to add because i don't do retinoblastoma and dr uh, namit disosa nicely summarized the uh, you know the uh, current status of the csr in fact one of the most common comments made by fellows when they join our hospital and work for some time is that they all thought that csr is a very simple disease to treat but then once they start seeing the chronic cases and difficult cases they find it extremely you know it's a complex disease and uh, today the management uh, you know is not so easy we have to look at multimodal imaging and also look at the other differential diagnosis that he highlighted very well and uh, dr manish bapai my, you know really showed uh, very challenging situations in the posterior segment so well especially the foreign bodies and uh, you know how he manages them and he also highlighted the importance of examination of the posterior segment all the all the speakers have taken a lot of pains to uh, you know emphasize the salient points you know i think they did a very good job uh, dinesh sir Thank you, Murli Dasar, uh, for contemplating. I agree with Murli Dasar. Actually, there's very little to add to this. Um, you actually uh, more or less provided an entire book of uh, all these conditions, and um, uh, so I mean, I, I frankly speaking, I I don't think there's much to say. Um, it's only a question of now assimilating this uh, information because there's a lot of information, and. Uh, how this gets assimilated and when you present it you have to you have to know that you present the only the salient features like for example um, there may be hundreds of differentials but just one the first three four are the ones which are relevant and the rest depends on getting the uh, if the examiner wants to ask you something don't provoke the examiner into asking you something which you know very little about that is the first Uh, the first uh, lesson about any exam is don't don't push the examiner into those areas where you know less so stick to uh, sometimes better to speak less and uh, respond to whatever you are asked thank you sir uh, jatinder sir you are muted mute unmute yourself Yeah, I would just like to congratulate everyone. Uh, very nice talks. Uh, particularly impressed with the the last session of the talks. Very nicely presented. Very holistic approach. Uh, some points are here and there, but I think we are running quite late. Uh, I think many many points to get back to the protein. 
thank you so much everyone and thank you ma'am and uh, shrinivas for like letting me be a part of this so i think i should come to my conclusion remarks uh, i mean it goes without saying that these two and a half hours have been a brilliant learning webinar and would you believe it being a completely anterior segment surgeon i heard every bit of all that you all spoke though i don't know how much i'm going to remember but i've definitely appreciate your quality of work a lot more henceforth on behalf of arc a special thanks to our expert expert panel and of course uh, the wonderful sessions which are so beautifully put together by srinivas uh, joshi that made it all the more interesting our thanks are always due to our aos admin which uh, headed by mr kripal and his team mr sunil who is our webinar admin you must have seen how minutely he uh, associates with this each of these webinars and keeps a tap on our uh, time and duration of talks sai and manjula who do all the background work for arc and they definitely help in leading arc forward our deep felt thanks is to be expressed to entoed with very very great conviction because every single webinar which i have conducted from my beginning of my tenure to to now has been sponsored by entoed and i am deeply grateful to them and finally most importantly the only thing which eggs us arc team forward is the attendees number which i keep bothering uh, mr sunil to tell me at the end of the show and i would definitely update you too it is really truly uh, encouraging to have so many of them attending even now there were some 300 odd still there and we started off with very good numbers thank you one and all of you because it's you who makes these webinars so useful for us thank you thank Can you very much can we just pose for a photograph madam for the arc filing yes. so few of us okay smile uh, sunil can you just take a pic a uh, picture yeah manoj so, sir sunil yeah 1 2 3 click thank you thank you thank, thank you. you so much for the patient thank, thank you very much thank, thank you everybody thank you arc good night shrinivas and uh, thank you uh, thank you all for the wonderful webinar good night everybody